Okay. Can you hear me? Sir, Commissioner, yes, we hear you. So I will start by welcoming everyone uh, and do a recap. And then uh, I'll, I, ha I will introduce a short video of a student. And then I will introduce you. You do your keynote and Stavros will join for the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. And good morning for many of you also. The beauty of doing online events is we can accommodate different geographies. So we, we have uh, many people I see from different parts of the world, some morning, some evening. Once again, good day for all of you. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome the distinguished audience. My name is Elias Felful. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships. And once again, it is a great honor for me to serve as your MC for this final session. It's been an incredible three days, and we thank you for uh, a great engagement. Let me start first with some housekeeping announcement. Uh, you will see that you have the chat feature on the right side, but if you have any question, please use select the mark as a question option found uh, at the bottom next to the chat mode. Please, if you have any question, mark, mark it as a question. For those who would like to post on social media, please use hashtag education, education reimagined as you tweet or post about the session. Our handle, uh, our handle for the tweet account is at Capital Wise dash capital T W E E T S for tweets. Before we talk about the program, I will uh, post some questions just, just to know um, again, where are you joining us from? And then a second question will be about what is your role in education system? So you will see Paul uh, while I'm uh, introduce, uh, doing a recap of day two and day three, I appreciate you answer the poll. Before we talk about the program for the last session of this virtual event, I would like to mention uh, some highlights from yesterday and uh, from today's session. Yesterday, Safina Hussein, founder of Educate Girls, gave a powerful speech that highlighted the importance of student agency especially for young girls. By empowering them through education, we in turn have the power to influence society at a large and can create a more inclusive world for all of us. We had also the honor and the privilege to welcome the mayor of Medellin, Daniel Quintero, who also, you know, explain the success story of, of Medellin and how education is at the heart of those uh, reform and successes. Earlier today, we also had the honor of hearing from Mrs. Yang Lan, the co-founder and chairperson of Sun Media Group and Sun Future Art Education Foundation. During her keynote, she underlined the purpose of education as a means of holistic growth and the social development of children. I think we can all agree that social and emotional learning is so important and we will need to involve stakeholders from across our communities if we are to see this as a central component of future learning. And for, for the video we posted, it will be available on uh, the channel, the, the, the social media of, of, of WISE, so I uh, advise you to have a look at the work that is coming out of uh, the Sun Future Art Foundation. We also had the opportunity to speak with Janvi Canoria, Director of Innovation at Education Above All Foundation, who spoke about how COVID-19 highlighted deep-rooted inequalities in our education systems, inequalities that have long existed before this pandemic. However, as she demonstrated, this crisis has also challenged us to be resourceful with the tools we have at hand so that we can support all learners 
no matter their economic or social backgrounds. And finally, in our panel with uh, Maria Spice, the co-founder and co-CEO of Holland IQ, we explored trends around ad tech. Interestingly enough, an audience poll during this panel showed over a third of attendees today thought that the greatest impact on education innovation over the next five years would come from government policy and funding rather than from schools or private capital. Technology and the education sector will continue to be one of our main focuses as we move into the second pro program of the day. Related to this broad topic will be session that examine how education stakeholders can build better, more sustainable partnerships with actors in private sector, how it can empower them to innovate and what it means for the digital divide. Some of today's key questions include, how can we help the tech sector's growth in education gain momentum while maintaining access to education as a universal right? The second question, what does a blended dis or distance learning mean for students from underprivileged or minority communities? Or what does innovation look like in a post-COVID-19 world? Before we jump into the next segment, there will be another question, and I would love to hear from you, please. Which enabling factor needs the most disruption for ed tech to be effective and available to all? Please answer this, this question. And in the meantime, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the last uh, 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 video of our selected students. So um, the next uh, speaker, the student speaker, is a learner's voice program. Uh, Elena Pipa is an outspoken youth leader from Athens, Greece, and had worked hard within her community to advocate for students' rights. It is my pleasure to uh, let the video of Lina, of Elina, uh, start. So my name is Elina Pipa. I'm 16 years old and I'm a junior in high school in Athens, Greece. And um, I had the opportunity in November of 2019 to be part of the WISE Learner's Voice cohort and attend the WISE um, Summit of Education. And I had the opportunity to speak with a lot of people that um, influence education and decisions on education and give them um, my input as a student uh, on what I think that um, education needs and um, how to shape the future of education. I think that the hardest part for me as a student was getting used to the idea of not having face-to-face -face classes, which for me meant the loss of human connection between teacher and student. In the WISE conference, we discussed the implications of technology in education and how online environments may interrupt the mental and emotional connection that exists between teacher and student when teaching face-to-face, -face, which is definitely relevant to what we are living right now in all of our educational systems. I think that despite having this difficulty, if a teacher has a desire to teach and the student a desire to learn, emotional bonds can still form in an online classroom setting, which I successfully and thankfully did so myself. What the realities of this pandemic have resulted in for me is an altered worldview. I reconsidered my priorities. Being a junior student, you place so much of your emphasis and importance in very little things like a bad grade on a test or your parents not letting you go out and each seems like the end of the world. You place so much of your energy in the bad and the small things and take for granted the truly important things such as your health and your safety. The realities that I experienced highlighted the fact that I should not take the most important factors in my life for granted. I can safely say that I am much more grateful for my life now than I was before. One thing I believe this experience taught all of us is the importance of the collective. We realize the importance of collective health, safety, and now the importance of equality and justice for all, 
given recent developments. What I want to see from now on in education is the teaching of these values in school curriculums. Due to emphasis on an individual success and in the educational environment, many times values that inspire unity, compassion, and equality are forgotten to be taught to students. I want to see teachers that teach the importance of the collective to students. The most important action in empowering students to become active in being architects of their own learning is letting us know that we are heard by you, the adults that currently make all the decisions about our education. All that is needed is to talk to us, want conversation, and let our voices and our opinions shine through and actually be heard by you. Be open to criticism, understand our view, listen to our ideas, and reassure us that you will always be there to support us both intellectually and emotionally. This is the only way that education can evolve in a meaningful and successful manner. That was a brilliant talk from Elena. And I can tell you, uh, dear audience, that when we did these films, we were impressed by the level of, you know, intellectual presence and, and, and how powerful they were uh, the, the, with ideas. And, and, and so it, it, Elena is, is one of those uh, excellent students who, who, who really, uh, who really did uh, mark her her uh, uh, the, the video? So let me let me move to uh, to the next segment, which is uh, to introduce you to uh, Mr. Christos Tilianidis, who is the European Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management, uh, and he is currently also visiting professor in the practice of the Department of Health Policy of the London School of Economics. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Uh, it's it's a it's a new experience online, but we will uh, we will uh, share uh, anything new to the audience. After your keynote, uh, Stavros Yanuka will join for a conversation with you. The stage is yours, sir. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm following your instructions, Elias, and to say also uh, to say both good evening and good morning because uh, some of our audience uh, definitely uh, they, we, they are in a different uh, time than uh, in Europe or in Middle East. So good afternoon from Brussels. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers um, for this opportunity. And at the same time to say that uh, it's an honor to me to be once again speaker in that very reputable event, the WISE conference specialized on education issues. Um, in this session, we have to focus on evaluating the impact of the pandemic in the education field. And at the same time, we should find, we should discuss new innovative ways to accelerate our common effort to build cross-sectoral coalition for more equity and, of course, to bridge the digital divide. Um, some of you, they know about uh, my passion for education and as uh, a European Commission in the last five years. I focus on education, especially in education emergencies, and this is why during my mandate, I decided to increase the budget for education emergencies uh, in the European Union 10 times, from 1% to 10% of our whole budget. Um, and uh, I would like to say a few words about what Elias already underlined. Um, of course, uh, it was very important that uh, he underlined that we have to focus on, girl, on girls' education. 
because it's very important, especially in a conflict areas and in areas uh, such as Africa or Middle East, because uh, through my experience as commissioner, I realized that we need girls and women to be more engaged in all aspects of educational systems, in all aspects of educational things, because in particular, in some countries, especially in Africa, they are the most important pillar of the whole society. So my uh, advice, my modest advice uh, is to see more funding for education for girls. And of course, I, I completely agree with Elias that yes, we need the engagement of the private sector. We have to find once again, more ways, more innovative ways in order to see what we, we call as PPP, private public partnership, in particular in educational field. But today, as I said, we have to focus about uh, the impact of the pandemic in the education field. So what is the session context? in this dimension. Managing a crisis like COVID-19 has required the collective efforts of actors from across the education sector and beyond. Some of the most creative solutions to the unique challenges that now face us have emerged thanks to these partnerships. As we begin to move beyond the immediate effects of this pandemic, the lessons we take forward will be what defines our systems in the coming years. The transition to distance learning over the last few months seems to have underlined the systemic problems the education sector has long faced in realizing true equity and access for all. Technology provides us with endless opportunities to innovate, but the online frontier is also riddled with obstacles for those marginalized communities already struggling to keep pace with an ever-evolving landscape. I would like to, to suggest some angles specifically for, not more, because of the limit of the time. First, engaging students within rural, rural or humanitarian context often requires the support of a number of different stakeholders. How do you ensure that we leverage the expertise of all sectors to reach the most marginalized population and not worsen the equity gap? Very critical question, I think. Second point, how do we sustain cross-sector coalition so that our education systems become more agile, capable of adapting to this new evolving landscape and do not leave anyone behind? My third point, what should the education sector expect from technology? Not just so its individual stakeholders are better prepared for uncertain future, but also so that its networks become more agile and resilient and accessible to all. And my fourth point, education is no longer a sector defined by academics and practitioners alone, but rather the experiences of multi-level stakeholders working toward common goals. How do you expect the education landscape to evolve following this recent crisis and will this inform the way we build coalitions 
moving forward. This is, I think, very crucial questions in order to, um, to be in touch with the new hard reality and also with many new opportunities because of new experiences of all people, even during this unprecedented situation because of the COVID-19. The COVID-19 crisis has been an intense learning period on the potential of digital technologies in education and the digital readiness and resilience of our educational systems, not only in Europe, but also across the world. There will be many lessons we can learn from this period of disruption. And uh, over the past weeks, many teachers have become familiar with the vast array of tools and resources available to them. Students, teachers, and parents have seen the possibilities and also the limitations of learning remotely with digital means. We have also seen that inequalities and divisions have been amplified during the period of school closure. Not all students have access to the technology they needed and their home environments may do not be conducive to learning. At EU level, a shared goal is to have high quality and inclusive education, which is suited to the digital age in which we live. But uh, no doubt that uh, the hard reality during this unprecedented situation has shown that this is a common goal but is really far away from the reality on the ground, even inside Europe. Can you imagine in other continents, in Africa, in some areas in Latin America, in Asia? So we have to talk about these new digital tools in order to find these innovative ways, as I said, to reduce this equity gap. Few words about uh, on digital uh, tools. The better, the best resources and, and platforms are the ones that meet the needs of teachers and learners for the task in hand. Pedagogical goals should always come before the choice of technology. Teachers need to be able to find and use quality resources in an efficient way and for students, accessibility and usability of the sources are vital. One example about the European Union initiatives. The European Commission has mobilized its own education platforms, e-twin, school education gateway and a ballet, the platform for adult learning, just to support teachers and educators adapt to the new reality of remote teaching and learning. But I would like to say also a few words about the other side of distance learning. Nevertheless, we have also seen where there are limits to learning through online technology that we have to overcome a huge digital divide and we are perhaps more aware than before of how we, uh, we require physical interaction to embed learning. I think Elena underlined in a very precise way about this eye contact necessity in some 
educational fields with some educational purposes. The risk of widening educational inequalities is very high. The closure of educational and training institutions raised serious concerns regarding access, inclusion, and equity. Those without access to suitable digital devices is in a supporting learning environment, including disadvantaged and marginalized groups or those who do not speak the language of the country sufficiently well are at particular risk of being excluded from learning. It's a big, dangerous situation. So, my conclusion about digital tools. Digital skills and capabilities will be vital for economic recovery and transformation. As the digital economy will be a leading driver of our economy recovery over the coming years, the demand for digital skills will grow. But, as I said, it, at the same time, it is a critical tool in order to see more equity in God. And this is my personal fear. At the same time, yet digital skills alone will not will not be enough. To lead the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, we must give all young people the chance to develop the full range of key competencies. One, this is a real figure from the European uh, statistics. One in five young Europeans still lack adequate reading, months or science skills, and this is a drag on the future of our economy. Therefore, investing in those basic skills at school level has become more relevant than ever. You can imagine the same figures, for example, in Africa or in some areas in Latin America, definitely they are worse than in Europe. And on top of this, globalized and automated economies put a higher premium on such key competences as creativity, critical thinking, taking initiative, and problem solving. These competences will be key to coping with complexity and fast changing work environments. So, the initial lessons from the COVID-19 crisis show that acting swiftly with targeted measures will be essential to drive forward necessary innovations. However, deep transform national change in digital education and training is also needed for growth and innovation and to build a fairer, more cohesive, co coherent, more inclusive and sustainable work. Just some figures from UNESCO on the global situation. In this unprecedented uh, situation because of the COVID. Half of the total number of learners, some 826 million students kept out of the classroom by the COVID-19 pandemic, do not have access to a household computer, and 43%, more or less, 700 million have no internet at home at the time when digital-based distance learning is used to ensure educational continuity in the vast majority of the country. Nearly 90% of students in sub-Saharan Africa do not have household computers, while 82% are, are unable to get online. So this is the hard reality regarding of some positive signs about digital learning and about some new state of play in some universities across the world.
I'm a visiting professor in three universities at LSC, at Boku Universities and Medical School in Nicosia. And I, I made a lot of lectures through online uh, learning. But at the same time, there is the other side of the coin. What I already described through UNESCO, UNESCO figures. My last point, last but not least, through my experience as a EU Ebola coordinator for many years, and I know well the medical field because of my medical background, I have to say that we have to utilize these new excellent digital tools for the medical field. I talk a lot with my good friend and my compatriot Stavros Yanukas about this, and I strongly believe that if we utilize in very innovative ways these digital tools, we can see even far away from big hospitals, big countries, some doctors make operations through artificial intelligence instruments. And also, and this is what we realize, it is a, a real lesson learned from our experience through COVID-19 that we have to increase our effort, to accelerate our efforts, to see more general practitioners, practitioners to be more efficient and effective during pandemics, and of course, to see more doctors um, more prepared in public health issues, in particular in countries in areas in Africa, maybe Middle East, and also Latin America and Asia. So we have to change our approach in some aspect of the medical field. And this is the real lesson learned of this pandemic and also of the previous pandemic, of the previous outbreak, Ebola outbreak in Africa. Thank you so much for this opportunity again. And now I'm ready to discuss many things through Q&A. Thank you. Commissioner, it's uh, nice to see you. Nice to have you with us again. Uh, I don't know if you can see me but uh, or hear me. Yes, of course. Excellent. Yes. Good. It's nice to see you again. And I want to start just by um, having you reflect a little bit on your experience with the Ebola epidemic and just tell us a little bit about the role that education played in that response. Was that was that part of the uh, part of the response or or were you very much just focused on the medical emergency there? Stavros, um, you know that one of the major challenge we had in West Africa in the Apple outbreak 2014 was just to educate not the students, not the teenagers, not the pupils, but the parents about the necessity of the wash, wash yeah. their hands. It was a game, a game changer in our effort at that time in order to defeat the Ebola virus in West Africa and to avoid the pandemic as now. Even now, in Europe, many people, after the first victims in Italy, in Spain, and in other areas in Europe, they realize the importance of the, of, of the washing of their hands. They didn't realize that this is one of the most preventing measures. So it's part of what we, what we call as the educational process about basic hygiene measures. Mm -hmm. So we have to focus on this. And uh, yeah. even now in, in very developed countries, the people and the societies, they cannot realize the importance of this yeah. so basic educational needs. Yeah. But no. at the same time, 
I think we need education, we need digital tools, we need um, online learning in order to approach the people and to convince them about the necessity of the social distancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to find these innovative ways in some uh, European countries we saw very, really innovative and very clever uh, advertisements in order to reach the people, the ordinary people, and to understand what, yeah. what we mean about social distancing and about the importance of this behavior. Yeah. So um, I think uh, um, because even now we are in the middle of the storm, we have to continue through education and through specific education initiatives in order to reach the people and to persuade them about the necessity of these basic behaviors regarding any yeah. pandemic, regarding any outbreaks. Yeah, no, that, that's 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 good. And then you know, my my question was uh, had a uh, an ulterior motive because part of, part of what we're trying to do in this uh, uh, event is to reimagine what education should comprise. Uh, and I think very often we forget that you know, good basic health yeah. requires a, a strong education component. Um, and that really hasn't come up that much in, in, in our discussion, so I'm glad we, we touched on it today. I, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, um, and that comes from one of my colleagues, uh, Victoria. Now, she says that you know civil society is well-placed, she says, to apply basic technology to support learning in uh, emergency uh, system, uh, situations. Um, her question is, what, what in your view uh, can uh, mainstream education learn from the way civil society responds in, uh, in emergency and crisis? Sorry, Stavros, I, I, I could not hear you in the last two, three sentences. Can you repeat yeah, so this? Yes. Yeah, the, the question was that uh, uh, civil society is pretty good at applying basic technologies in emergency uh, situations to support uh, learning. Um, and the question is, what can uh, mainstream education learn from these experiences? No doubt that we, we saw a really very positive response from the social um, for the public opinion for the civil society about the um, common um, response regarding COVID-19. And, um, but uh, at the same time, I believe that uh, we have more tools in order to use the regular educational process just to deal with this uh, um, devastating pandemics and outbreak. I, I already said and emphasized on my experience as a visiting professor in some uh, medical schools, and I strongly believe that we have to see again our efforts globally about the new necessity regarding general practitioners, practitioners and also about doctors who can specialize in public health. Yeah. In some um, cases, we ignore, sorry for this very strong word, but we ignore that uh, we need also an excellent neurological surgeon, an excellent oncologists against uh, cancer, but at the same time, we mm -hmm. need, in particular in some areas, very good general practitioners. Because yeah. the, the first line, the, the front, the forefront, are the general practitioners, are the doctors who 
specialized in public health. And we need them with a, 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 a real efficient and effective background in order to have what we said as a common standards, the global common standards. Otherwise, we cannot communicate each other. And we yeah. saw many times this real problem on the ground. So we have to see many things about what I say, what I, I said, I, I am saying global governance. And it's another big discussion and big debate about the vaccine now. We need new rules and regulation about global governance, not about common standards regarding GPs mm -hmm. and public health doctors, but also about the allocation of vaccine, about who yeah. is ready to give the vaccines to their people before others, and why we, we, we will see maybe a sort of discrimination between nations and between people. So yeah. it's a big debate, and I think COVID-19 already raised this issue, and we have to yeah. see through UN system, through multilateral system, where we can start this discussion about new rules in the global governance, in particular in the medical field, and of course, we have to keep our competition between pharmaceutical companies because it's it's another aspect of the efficiency of this yeah. global government. Thank you so much, Stavros. Thank you, Commissioner. Again, always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, you, you've raised, I think, some some very interesting points that that go you know, beyond the sort of narrow remit of education and schooling, but nevertheless, they are, I think, critically important. Uh, and it's entirely appropriate that a, a gathering such as this should should be addressing those issues. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Goodbye from Brussels. Goodbye. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank nice you, Nice to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stavros, very much for this uh, great conversation. I am very happy now to move to the next uh, segment of our program and introduce you to uh, a dear friend of WISE and a great partner, uh, we've been we've been doing some extraordinary uh, roundtables uh, in Doha, and we also met in Beijing, and we we had planned a lot of great things, but COVID had other plans. Uh, let let me, without any further ado, let me introduce you to Patrick Brothers, who is the co-founder and C and co-CEO of Holland IQ. Uh, Holland IQ is a global market intelligence platform for education, and platform is a long-standing member of the World Economic Forum and B20 Education uh, and Employment Task Force. He is passionate about transforming the way the world learns, and he will show us this passion uh, in this panel. Uh, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elias. Very kind of you. Um, wonderful to partner again and, and share some insights. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this session. It's really inspirational reading all the comments and seeing just how global our audience is at the moment. Um, let me share a little bit with you now about uh, what we're going to cover over the next 45 minutes. Um, I'm joined by some wonderful colleagues I'll introduce very shortly uh, from Africa, from Latin America, um, from Europe, and all, all with a global perspective. We're going to look at new approaches, opportunities, and challenges in ed tech in a post-COVID world. Um, firstly, I'm gonna race through some insights to really set the scene of what um, Holland IQ has seen through this period and then zooming out uh, more globally. Then we're gonna look at, and we're gonna ask um, my colleagues to share their insights on which technologies and tools are thriving and, and what the gaps are that they see. We'll then move on to um, looking at what are the challenges and the opportunities as we look beyond COVID. What trends do we see? Uh, where do we see education and education technology supporting education heading? Um, there'll be some audience engagement through this period as well, like, like all good um, digital learning. Um, I've got some polls. I'd really like to hear from all of you, and I'd like all of us to see what the collective perspective is on, on some of these areas. Before we head into the session, let me make a couple of quick introductions um, for my colleagues who'll be joining us and sharing sharing their insights. 
Firstly, um, Jose Escamilla, better known as Pepe, is the director and leads Tech Labs from Tech to Monterey in Mexico. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Tech to Monterey is doing some incredible work across Latin America, um, being picked up more globally as well. Um, the Tech Labs is Tech de Monterey's Disruptive Innovation Unit. Uh, Jose also has formerly been the Dean of Graduate School of Education, um, has a PhD in Artificial Intelligence. We're, we're so fortunate to have Pepe with us today. Krista Davidson. Krista is the Head of Programs and Operations at Ingini. And for those of you who are not aware, Ingini is Africa's EdTech Incubator. It's the only specialised organisation supporting EdTech and that grassroots innovation and technology um, across Africa. Um, Krista also has a wonderful career in social impact, working with vulnerable and under-resourced communities. Thank you again, Krista, for joining us. We're so lucky. And finally, Owen Hankel. Owen Hankel is investment director at Pearson Ventures. Um, we'll all, most of us, I'm sure, would be aware of, of Pearson, a really proud history and an exciting future. Um, Owen is also working in artificial intelligence. He's studying a PhD at Oxford at the moment of artificial intelligence education. I have no idea where he gets the time to do that alongside uh, scanning the, the global education innovation environment. Um, my colleagues will join me shortly and we'll, we'll ask questions and, and have them share their insights. Please also, as we're moving through the session, post any questions that you have um, in the side as well. Okay, let's take a really quick look at um, EdTech innovation and funding um, as it relates to COVID. You'll see here uh, on the slide the results of a survey we did with HolonIQ's executive panel, which is about two and a half thousand ministers, CEOs, uh, senior leaders in public, private, and all sorts of organizations who are specifically uh, working in education. We asked them two questions and we asked them these questions most importantly it was late march just as we were all being hit by the shock and the reality of how large and how impactful COVID would be on education on the left hand side was their responses to the short-term impact of COVID, and on the right hand side is their responses to the long-term impact of COVID. and you can see it's it's no surprise we've all been through this through the short term um, across all parts of education and education technology, the uh, impact was seen as, as very significant and that was gonna be significant over the long term. Institutions, you can see in the long term there, um, calling out that they saw the, the most impact over the long term. The geographic impact, uh, no region was left uh, without impact. We, we, all, we, all, we all know this, this truly was a global pandemic. Um, again, the short-term impact and the long-term impact was seen uh, quite significantly across all of the um, across all the world. Really interestingly, we, we asked two questions. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side was was those executives' expectations of disruption. Was it going to be in the next 24 months? Was it going to be before 2025? Was it going to be before 2030? Um, we've asked this question many times over the years. We've never seen such a massive response of the expectation of leaders across all parts of education seeing massive disruption beyond COVID, disruption to education as we know it. And on the right hand side, we asked those leaders where they were looking for growth and for impact. And unsurprisingly, but much more than we'd seen historically, it was on new technologies being the number one area um, of focus. Just zooming out for a second, um, education is a massive part of our lives, but it's also a massive part of the global economy. Nearly already $6 trillion is spent by governments, by individuals and families, and by companies on learning. And that will grow. That will grow over time again to be an enormous part. Over $6 trillion um, is invested. However, less than 3% of all of that investment, again, by governments, by individuals, uh, by institutions, is spent on digital or was spent on digital. The question now is what will we see that move to? Um, this was a uh, forecast that Holon IQ had made before COVID. In fact, last year, 
We saw it growing from $153 billion spent in around 2018 and more than doubling to $342 billion, still only making up 4.3% of all of that um, expenditure by, by governments and by individuals and by corporations around the world. I think, I think it's fair to say that we're all expecting that will change quite significantly. There has been for a long time a significant amount of investment um, by way of venture capital in education technology over time as well. This chart here shows you over the last 10 years and in the first quarter of 2020, uh, that level of investment. You can see in 2018, over $8 billion was invested, much of it coming from Asia, much of it coming from the US, but increasingly it's coming from, from all around the world. Um, where we'll be releasing our, our Q2 insights and it's fair to say that uh, EdTech is really starting to pick up pace in the eyes of investors and those with capital to support innovation. Quickly, some of the trends that we're seeing across those investments, we're seeing a lot of investment in skills and jobs. That's by way of mentoring, all sorts of skills mapping, industry specific upskilling as well. Language learning has all, always been a large part of education innovation, but now we're seeing peer-to-peer -peer models through technology, voice technology, chatbots and the like. Higher education is entering an era of uh, public-private partnerships, bringing together the best of both of those institutions to support the learners, embedding skills verification into degrees um, and the like. We're seeing really strong, and especially through COVID learner support, test preparation and tutoring. Students are more isolated than they've ever been. They're requiring that support, Q&A platforms, question banks. LMSs and management systems, for those who have been in education for a long time, in education technology, would be sick of hearing about LMSs, but you'd be surprised that very, very few institutions as a share of all um, have an LMS or have a student management system. And it's critical to supporting those learners. STEAM and coding is an area that we've all heard about over the last few years as well. It's still driving forward financing education, microfinancing loans, supporting students with the investment required to gain those skills. And then finally, and again, we'll hear more about this shortly, AR, VR, games and simulation, using advanced technology to immerse the learner in, in new ways of learning as well. I'm gonna pause here before we more formally bring um, my colleagues on stage and ask you uh, the question that is uh, in the poll area of your screen right now, I'm trying to get to it myself. Where, where do you think the greatest impact on education innovation will come from over the next five years? Will it come from universities, schools and institutions, from the, those grassroots? Or will it come from government? Will it be policy? Will it be action? Will it be regulatory? Will it be public funding? Or will that greatest area come from partnerships? We heard from the commissioner as well, who was thinking of partnerships as one of those areas? Or will it come from the private sector and capital by way of other forms fueling more, uh, more typical technology innovation um, from the private sector and funding as well? If you can uh, complete that poll, that would be greatly appreciated. Let's take a quick look. So if you're not seeing that poll in your screen, Public-private partnerships is leading at 42%. University schools institution led at 30%. Government policy action and private capital are about equal. Although we're moving around, we're gonna come back and take a look at that shortly. But if I can ask for my colleagues to join me on stage, we'll move into the next section. Pepe, great to see you, Krista. And hopefully Owen as well. Perfect, Owen, okay. As introduced uh, from uh, my right to, to left, uh, Pepe from Tech de Monterey, Krista from Ingini and, and Owen from, from Pearson Ventures. Thank you all so much for, for sharing your time and your insights. Let's make a quick start. 
Um, Krista, can I start with you? Because we've got a couple of slides that you kindly shared uh, from an Ingini perspective. Um, what are the tools and the technologies that you're seeing as thriving or successful? And what are some of the gaps that, that you see that still need to be addressed? Sure, yeah. So thank you, Patrick. Uh, so I've put together a few slides with just some examples of African edtech solutions that Ingini has worked with in one way or another. Um, almost all of them are actually our portfolio companies with the exception of, of one, which is actually a, a sister company. Um, so this isn't an, an exhaustive list of our companies, but uh, just a few highlights. So I think to, to comment on the question, um, e-learning platforms are sort of the most commonly known edtech solutions. Um, so, I mean, these platforms can, can range from the likes of Coursera and edX to, to things like Khan Academy and Duolingo, just sort of globally known names in edtech. Um, but across the board, you know, we see a, a mixed efficacy of these solutions. Um, there are certainly some that have been developed on certain la sound learning principles, but not all. Um, you know, these are important inter interventions, but most of the, the most engaging of which are often not very accessible to, to the masses of developing markets. Um, and that's especially the case in, in Africa, in the African context. So, I mean, you know, for many going digital during this time of COVID-19, um, at least in South Africa, I know for sure, that really just meant moving to, to WhatsApp as, as like an online learning tool. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it's better than, than nothing, but it's, it's, not, it's not good enough for, for the learners of the continent. Um, so, I mean, you know, there are solutions like, like those you see in that top, that left column under education accessibility. Um, those guys are all trying to address this problem. They're trying to make education more accessible and, and, and really contextualize their solutions with considerations for the infrastructure in developing markets like, like the African context. Um, but I mean, you know, there, there just aren't enough like this. It's, it's a really sort of a rare type of solution to come by. Um, you know, one that caters for, for feature phones or, you know, a solution that doesn't actually require any sort of connectivity or or any sort of smart device. It's it's not very common um, that you have high quality learning content on on feature devices or, or other kinds of um, of technology. So yeah, I mean, if we skip over to the digital literacy uh, block in the, the bottom right, um, you know, that's another example of of a startup in our, our current cohort actually that is using some sort of some in-person intervention so it's you know not necessarily super contextual for for the COVID-19 crisis but but these guys are working on digital literacy and, and trying to get African learners into a position where they can really compete on a global stage um, yeah and then just you know speaking to the other two columns on this on this slide specifically um, you know a really key need in Africa and in a lot of developing market markets is is this sort of need for, for upskilling and employability. Um, you know, the South African uh, unemployment rate right before COVID hit was just released as as 40%, the, the expanded unemployment rate, which is just, I mean, it's it's crazy to think about, um, you know, where we're going to be after this this crisis. So there are a lot of digital upskilling platforms like like those that I've listed here that are trying to, to get learners ready for sort of the, the 21st century. Um, giving them some digital skills and and access to to other types of skills that, that might help them to create a, a more stable income. Um, so these are all really 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 critical needs, and I think you know there's there's a lot of room in this category for for more solutions that are are based on evidence and um, you know are highly efficient for for our our context specifically in Africa. Um, yeah, I mean the the professional support that's. I think it's it's pretty um, notoriously known that that many teachers in in the African context, especially in the, the public sector, are are underqualified, um, usually as a result of just low compensation and um, under resourcing of, of the schooling systems. So interventions like One Million Teachers and Accelerated help to to train teachers on the ground and, and give them the tools they need to become better in, in schools. So I mean, more sort of support resources for, for teachers. Um, I would certainly like to see more of that. Um, that's, that's really grounded in our context. 
Um, OTRAC is one that's very, very much geared to the healthcare industry, which is also relevant in, in today's pandemic. Um, so they, they offer continued professional, professional development to healthcare workers um, in Nigeria, which is, you know, otherwise pretty expensive and outdated system of training that, that's being offered there as an alternative. Um, and then if you go on to the next page, Patrick, uh, finally on this page, I've just included some, some other solutions in our portfolio that are providing very localized and engaging learning and assessment tools. Um, again, the differentiator here is really that these are contextual. Um, you know, they have a, a strong consideration for the local environment and infrastructure um, and just the needs of the learners that, that they're, they're trying to reach. Um, all of these are, are very, very much evidence driven and, um, you know, that's why we're, we're quite proud to support them. Um, and then I've included a few language learning tools that are in our portfolio as well as LMSs because, you know, they're all sort of nice to haves, but, but also, you know, critical needs in, in the space. Um, although there are, you know, giants out there like Duolingo for language learning, like Google Classrooms for, for LMSs that are, are, you know, doing well to serve, serve the masses. Um, yeah, those are just some of my, my wow. thoughts there based on my experience. Fascinating. Thanks, Krista. Mm -hmm. Pepe, is, what, what are you seeing in Latin America? Uh, how does that, uh, how does what Krista's saying differ from, from what you're saying from a tech lab's perspective? Yes, I, um, I would like to say first that there are a lot of um, inequalities in the region as in other parts of the world. Um, um, for instance, just in Mexico, we had uh, 36 million uh, students that were left out of the education with the pandemic. And uh, when you see some uh, statistics created by the World Bank, because we don't have uh, statistics uh, from our countries individually, uh, you see that 14% uh, uh, of those students in Latin America continue using TV, so no internet, 9% using radio, and 5% uh, using paper. So if you adopt that, that gives uh, 28. And then there's 20% that is multimodal. And I can tell you that in Mexico, maybe that's multimodal because most of the public system moved to TV plus paper. No? So mm. a huge amount of people that were left out of technology. So one of my first things is, uh, I, I would love to see more technology and more access to the internet in the region, but maybe we also need to have some tools that use technology and don't depend on the internet. Uh, mm. on, on constant access to the internet uh, that are less expensive on the internet. Uh, for those that uh, had access to technology uh, that are in the most part of the countries on the private sector uh, for K-12 and higher education in general, uh, what I saw is that they were, they have uh, LMS uh, contracted, not used, and they start to use those LMS more intensively. Uh, we saw also a surge uh, on K-12 for uh, games because, uh, in fact, mm -hmm. what we did is not online learning. We did remote learning. That is just translating what we are already doing uh, to uh, using Zoom or other technologies. And it becomes very boring very soon. So they, uh, they try to make it more interesting. And then uh, two other two tools uh, that were um, everyone was asking about that was labs, laboratories, uh, mm -hmm. how we can replicate labs, laboratories, and assessment. In particular, assessment, uh, on my opinion, is a little bit overrated because most of the assessment right now, high, high stakes assessment in the traditional face-to-face -face model relies on exams that are proctored. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, many people were looking at technologies that allow you to proctor uh, those exams. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, that will be, in general, my assessment of the uh, of the situation here in, in Latin America. Pepe, just picking up on a point that you made, and maybe it's a question for both you and Krista, is like, what is the level of expectation that the the broadband infrastructure and mobile connectivity would grow over the next ten years to even support that? I mean, is that something that you know, experienced folks like yourselves are thinking, well, that that's not going to happen. So we're going to have to build alternatives to reach, you know, those millions who don't have access. Or, or do you think governments are actually rethinking that right now or, you know, public private partnerships and thinking, you know, if there was ever a time to invest in a very large scale 
mobile or, or or other connectivity like that that feels like a real enabler to ed tech in specifically your regions the two of you mm -hmm. you want to go first <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly hope to see more more government initiatives and, and um, private public uh, collaborations on on this topic specifically. You know, coming out of this crisis, I would imagine the the need is more clear than ever before. Um, yeah, yeah, I would I would imagine it needs to be you know the the leading telcos in our region, specifically in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, the leading telcos and and you know public sector. Um, stakeholders who, who need to be leading that much. Mm. Mm. Pepe? Yes, um, uh, I, I think it will depend on, on some countries. Uh, I, I, I don't see in Mexico, for instance, the, the will to uh, do that. Uh, the, the government that took office a couple of years ago, what they did is to uh, restrict uh, internet access. They reduced the number of schools that are connected to the internet. We had more schools connected. Well, you can also say that having the schools connected doesn't serve you when you're, everyone is at home, but that tells you about uh, some uh, uh, state of mind. And there are other countries that have better access to internet uh, in the region, in my opinion, will be Chile and Colombia that have more large access. So I, as well as Christos, I would love to see that uh, more people have access to the internet. We, Many people think that in Latin America, our countries are still very rural. It is not the case. Uh, most of our countries are very urban. So giving mm. access to a larger number of people is just there. It's a, it's a question of um, just last mile investment or uh, financing of, of uh, education. Uh, we still have people in rural uh, populations that is much more complicated and much more expensive. But mm. I think in Mexico is almost 90%, 85% is urban. And uh, the access of internet should be around 65 or 60 something. So that right. leaves a lot of space for, for growth. Mm. Uh, we did a, um, a study with um, uh, the uh, inter America Development Bank. And we finished that uh, survey in nine countries in Latin America. Uh, uh, we survey uh, faculty, uh, professors of universities in nine countries in Latin America. We ended that at the middle of March, just before the lockdown. So, mm. what uh, you find in that study is uh, uh, what uh, will uh, the problems that we have later. No? So, people were complaining of uh, very bad access to the internet, uh, mm. no vision from the uh, institution on what the technology should be used for. Uh, some of them say they don't have support from the IT department because the IT department only serves the administratives, not the faculty members around 50%. Training is uh, not intensive, around 50% of them report training. And out of seven, that 50%, 70% said that the training is bad. Uh, so that says that the focus is has not been there, no? Yeah. So my, my wish is that this will be like a, a call for um, the different institutions and countries to invest in that because uh, what we see right now is a situation that will continue for one year or maybe two years. And uh, we need that investment uh, in all those areas to grow. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't see all the countries uh, interested in that. So I think that uh, talking about this in, in public policy forums will be very helpful mm -hmm. to, to give mm -hmm. more ideas to the governments. That's great. Sorry, Owen, I think your microphone's off. Hey, there we are. Uh, yeah. usually I don't talk too much. Hey, everyone. Uh, Owen Hankel from Pearson Ventures. Um, I just wanted to add a few thoughts on that. Um, I think a way to think about it, the the ultimate reality is kind of the resources of the situations happening dictate what kind of technology you can use, if, if at all. And so um, in a lot of US school districts with maybe um, an affluent school district, there'll be a spare computer at the home. But then a lot of US school districts that maybe have a mixed income population, some of them are doing really great work to try to get loaner computers um, to uh, students, as well as kind of working with um, local telcos to kind of unbundle data for educational purposes. Now that's a great initiative, but it's obviously a solution for kind of a, a rich country, let's call it. Um, I think one step down, you see a lot of, sorry, and those initiatives are usually with Chromebooks or kind of uh, less expensive laptops. And those, ex those laptops can be less expensive because so much of the actual computing is done in the cloud. So they're, they're easy, they're relatively inexpensive, but they need good internet connections. 
So again, mm -hmm. that solution that you know works for maybe Miami Beach, Florida, but probably won't work for a lot of parts of the world. Um, a second solution is kind of going to smartphones, um, which is actually something that a lot more of the world uh, has access to. Um, so for instance, one of our a company and a nonprofit, they're aligned in India called Avanti, um, had to go from in-person tutoring to you know online tutoring overnight, like you know most most educational systems. And they had really great success, but a really interesting fact is that when they looked at the usage figures, a tremendous number were coming through um, KIOS, Chaos, which is an operating system that allows feature phones to kind of interact uh, with smartphone-enabled websites. So imagine one of those old feature phones that's not a full smartphone. You could still kind of watch a lower quality um, YouTube video, for instance. Now, again, you know, obviously for certain populations, they just won't even have money for data. But that would be something that probably a middle or working class family in a middle income country would be able to do. There would be a, there would be some data and there would be a feature phone, you know, and then the reality is in other places, that's just not the case. And so, you know, there's some interesting organizations. One I know it's called a Rising Academies Network. They're a school network in uh, uh, Sierra Leone and uh, other regional countries. And they've done some really amazing um, radio broadcasts. Um, which they actually learned from the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone three or four years ago, but they're launching that both in Ghana and Sierra Leone and Liberia. So that's a kind of you know an old tech solution. And you know, so I think that the in my opinion, the ultimate answer is you kind of have to do the best you can with the tools that are available. Um, mm -hmm. as the, the horizon for building out tech infrastructure is just, you know, it's a five, it's a five-year process. And you know, most educators right now are thinking about how am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna teach my student tomorrow? Yeah. Just one, more, one more thing, Patrick, just uh, if you allow me, very short. Uh, um, what we have seen also is an avalanche of uh, free offers from providers, yeah. uh, um, mainly from uh, edtech uh, companies. And we also see that for the fall semester, uh, that's not that will not be the case. That may not be the case. So we are seeing that many people are saying, oh, well, uh, we did that because it was a crisis situation. So uh, it can have uh, two different scenarios there. One of them is uh, for the schools that they will have to uh, pay for that, and that will be complicated. Some of them will not be able to pay. And for edtech providers that are smaller, maybe there's an opportunity also that uh, people will keep from a bigger one to a smaller one. So mm -hmm. there's an opportunity of having uh, grow in that situation if they have the possibility financially of doing that. It's fascinating. Yeah, it sounds like it, it really is like this blend of, as, as Owen said, like the best you can in the circumstances you have. But I, I would have thought we can even have innovation with radio. You know, if, if, if we focused, if we focused and said, look, for that segment, how can we innovate pedagogy using radio and teachers locally and that capacity? It doesn't all have to be about advanced technology for advanced economies as well. So that, that's that's really interesting. I'm going to keep moving because there's a lot to get through. Um, I want to ask another poll. We covered a lot of ground just now on um, on a whole spectrum, but I want to look at, at advanced technologies. There's been a lot of interest and a lot of Q&A at advanced technologies. And if the team can queue this poll up now for everybody, um, which advanced technologies, as we sit here in a COVID-style scenario, and you're looking forward thinking about the biggest positive impact on education, which advanced technology group do you think that would come from, the, the biggest impact? Will it come from AI? Will it come from virtual and augmented, more immersive realities? Will it come from voice-based technologies? Or will it come from robotics? Where, where do you see advanced technologies sit? Which are those advanced technologies? We've got a really strong tie with AI and VR AR, although VR AR is climbing ahead. Really interesting. We have seen a big push of immersive technologies. I think that's a big shift from the conversation we just had around radio and the like to, to the opposite level of people who have the luxury of uh, the, both the hardware and the bandwidth um, in order to uh, to immerse. But it's interesting. It's nearly at fifty percent now, as I can see this this poll. Any any comments just while we're on this poll from 
from what you're seeing, guys? Well, uh, I think that uh, virtual and augmented reality is not, are not that hard to do as artificial intelligence, uh, in my opinion. We're still right. not that, maybe in a five years, uh, we will have the PowerPoint of virtual reality or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I imagine that uh, that will uh, that will come uh, uh, and uh, that will not be the case of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence requires much more investment. Yeah, so I will mm, agree. Right. That virtual reality and augmented reality are requires less computation or power. Also, makes sense. Mm -hmm. My two cents. I'm a little biased on this because I'm actually kind of uh, researching uh, like voice voice recognition oh, yeah. education yeah but uh, i would actually say for me that is something that um is likely to happen mainly because there's a lot of um upfront investment in developing the kind of underlying algorithms but that's going to be done for broader purposes you know google or amazon or apple are doing that yeah. anyway and so then it's easy to kind of repurpose the core technology right. and change it a little bit um, and aside from that it's not too expensive whereas virtual reality it's great but you still have the headsets and there's all these other matters and so i think that we'll start seeing more kind of voice-based queries or you know kind of a, let's say uh formative assessment at a very basic level with uh like checks for understanding we call them i used to be a teacher so kind of like ongoing checks for understanding your classroom with a voice assistant yeah. um so the teacher doesn't go around and ask 30 kids it's like you kind of just talk to your assistant and you get the tallies sounds cool sounds very yeah. cool all right, I'm going to keep going. So moving on to the second part, uh, let's look beyond COVID. Let's start to think through um, how this might unfold, what this might mean as it does unfold. And we've got a couple of slides. I'm going to ask um, Owen to kick off on some perspectives from, from Pearson. Owen, can you take us through these two slides to get us going? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so these are just kind of some projections that uh, myself and the rest of our team had when we were thinking about some of the longer term impacts. Um, you know, we're part of Pearson. So even though we look at startups and maybe think a little bit longer timeline, we also see what's happening around kind of uh, current um, educational systems through Pearson. And so I guess these are six probably not particularly controversial um, ideas or predictions. Um, I think the first one is that boot camps will increasingly compete with universities. And again, these first three are basically things that were already happening that we think are going to accelerate due to the current situation. Right. So there's already moved to boot camps. Uh, for those of you who don't know, boot camp is I'll take three to six months, either in person or online, to learn a very specific skill, usually computer programming, um, with the idea of getting a, a relatively well-paying job at the end of that time. So it's kind of you know direct training to hiring. Um, I think that basically in the current environment, usually when there's um, economic problems, um, people consider it counter cyclical. So if there's a bad job market, people will go back to upskill or get a degree or just kind of wait out the bad job market in a university of uh, one form or another. And so in 2008, during that financial crisis, you saw a huge spike of higher education. Um, we think that will also happen again, but that instead of everyone going back to necessarily degree bearing programs, a significant portion of them, instead of saying, oh, do I want to sign up for a, a one year program? that costs you know, $5,000 to $10,000 that will give me a degree but not a job, I might look at a, a three-month program that costs $3,000 that gives me a 75% chance of a job. And so one of our portfolio companies, Springboard, does online boot camps, and we've seen just tremendous traction for them. You know, It's a combination of uncertain economic times and also everyone being stuck at home. But we think mm -hmm. that will be an ongoing trend. Um, second one is the segmentation of higher education. Um, I think that. Obviously, um, for a variety of reasons, enrollment rates are, are going to be really uh, low, um, in, at least in most countries that I know. But I specifically, I'm talking about rich countries in this case. Um, people mm -hmm. you know, either won't be able to afford university or may might not be able to go there in person, might not want to risk it. And so what will happen, though, is that even though you will see lower initial enrollments at every level, so let's call them elite um, you know, value and then budget, or something like three tiers of universities, the elite universities will still pull people up. So people who may, might not have gotten into their dream university, this will be their one chance. So the elite universities will still probably meet their enrollment targets, even though they have to open it up. And so we've been seeing this at universities, that universities are reopening admission processes to make sure they meet their cohort. This will kind of drag it from people from other schools. I believe that state-sponsored schools, although they'll be suffering and have to do budget cuts, the state will step in. You know, Either they're not going to let you know their universities fail. 
And so the, the universities you really see crunched are, are um, less prestigious independent universities um, who also will feel the, will feel kind of the drop in tuition immediately. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll leave that there. Uh, blended classrooms, again, this is happening. We think this will be mainstream um, for two reasons. Um, and by blended classroom, I mean doing some of your coursework at home virtually and some of your coursework in person. So instead of, you know, I would watch a lecture ahead of time and then I'd go into class and have a small group exercise or some variation thereof. Um, this is going to happen at the K-12 level just for public health reasons. Um, basically, there will be various local lockdowns, there'll be capacity issues, needs for social distancing, and so you, you won't be able to fit as many students in the building at the same time. And so there'll be all kinds of need to catch students up or deal with local lockdowns, and so there'll be lots of basically um, recovery or remedial work that will ultimately have to be done digital. And so school districts, K through 12 school districts, will just have to do this um, one way or another. At the higher ed level, um, this is going to happen mainly just for public health reasons. Um, you know, they're going to want social distancing, so you can't put 300 students in a lecture room. Um, seeing this at, you know, uh, Oxford uh, is famous for kind of having these tutoring sessions. And so they basically said they're going to have students next semester in the fall. People can live on campus, but there's no more large lecture classes. So what will happen is like maybe you can meet with your team in a safe space. Um, lectures will be recorded ahead of time that you can watch whenever you want. And then my kind of um, weekly check-ins with my teacher, which mm. is choice, that will happen by a video. So it's kind of forcing yeah. everyone to blended classrooms. So I think those are the three things that you'll see that were already happening, um, and that's just going to accelerate. I'm just, I know you've got a couple here. I'm, why don't we go through these as well, and then I'd love to hear, Krista and Pepe, what you're saying. Great, yeah. So these are three trends that you know weren't necessarily accelerating or going to happen, or you know we weren't sure. And then you know this is kind of just a a hard pivot or whatever you want to call it, like a big change that's structural due to COVID again. Um, the first is that you know as we can tell right now, you know a lot of your life is being done on um, video conferencing, and that's true you know throughout educational systems where there are those resources. Um, the question is kind of everyone's a little bit dissatisfied with Zoom or Hangouts or Teams or whatever you use for, for teaching. People feel like it's not quite there. Um, some people think like, oh, we need a Zoom for education. And we don't think that's going to happen, mainly because the underlying um, capital expenditure of maintaining a high quality uh, video network with low latency and the like is just prohibitively expensive for an industry specific startup. So there won't be a Zoom for education. What's going to happen instead is that Zoom, Teams, Hangouts, are going to make their video conferencing platform based. So educational applications will integrate via API. And so I know a lot of teachers right now who are basically doing, let's say, Google Hangouts plus Kahoot, which is basically a quiz. And, and they say it works pretty good. But right now, they have to kind of do the Kahoot thing, and then do the YouTube thing, and then do the Hangouts thing, and then also have to do grades. And what you're going to see is there'll be an ecosystem of API integrations, but there won't be a new Zoom for mm -hmm. Um, uh, this next one is just that there's going to be massive unemployment that already is, and so a lot of central governments are going to do government stimulus packages trying to get people back into work. Not just paying people to, um, you know, tide over, but there will actually be very high unemployment levels, and so you need people to start working to restart the economy, uh, very similar to previous depressions. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about, you know, kind of, uh, for this to work, you need jobs that can employ lots of people. So unlike a computer program where only a few, you want jobs that kind of require bodies to move around and do work. And so these will be service intensive jobs like construction, retrofitting, uh, personal, uh, like uh, healthcare and the like. And so there's been a lot of talk um, about uh, kind of green retrofitting or green construction in a major mm -hmm. industry that, that national governments are going to invest in only to get the, the kind of, it's an efficient way to get the economy restarted and you have the sustainability benefits. But you're going to have to, you know, let's say you're going to need 500,000 new retrofitters of houses because they're going to say, everyone, we want you to retrofit your house. And so that's going to create a lot of uh, micro training programs. You're like, oh, my God, we need to train 500,000 people on how to retrofit a house for solar in a month. Um, so that would be another trend. And that I'm just using the, the, the house uh, retrofit as example that will also be in allied healthcare, So like basic nurses, contact tracing, you know, all kinds of other industries. And finally, on remote proctoring, um, you know, if you think about uh, 
sitting a test is this long tradition. At, at, at Oxford, the examination school here has existed for 800 years. And for 800 years, they've made people come and sit and write. They, you can't write on computers for, for your tests to, to get your master's until this year. So they, they were kind of like the most tradition bound. They didn't care whether it was like, we're, we got to do what we want. And this year they changed. And so a lot of students are doing their examinations virtually. And so kind of the power of that shift, you know, there was no good reason that everyone should have to go to this old building, you know, dressed up like Harry Potter and write everything out by hand. It was just purely inertia. And that's very similar to lots of other high stakes testing. There's not actually that good of a reason it has to be there in person. It's mainly inertia and security concerns. And so the, the force function of saying you can't do it in person anymore will kind of break the mystique of in-person high stakes testing and make people much more open to online proctoring. So I'll, I'll at all. That's on. awesome. Thank you. Pepe, as you kind of zoom out and look forward, what, what are your expectations of what will change? Your, I think your mic's off. Pepe. Sorry, I was muted. I, I agree with um, with Owen, so I don't want to repeat. I will go to more soft things uh, that I think that we change in, in education. So what um, what we did was remote learning, which is not online learning. So I, I think that people will be more, I expect, prepared next semester and on fall, uh, at least on the northern hemisphere, so that we, have, we will have more time to do that. Uh, one of the things that I expect that will change in the future is also that people allow themselves to experiment they dare to experiment and uh, many times mm -hmm. don't do so this was the place where uh, in an emergency as we were flying the plane and we have to rebuild repurpose the plane where we were flying uh, people were allowed to uh, do new things not only with technology but also with pedagogy because re they realized that uh, what they were doing was boring and, uh, and and try to experiment and try new things so I believe that that culture of experimentation can last if this also lasts for a few more months or year. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, uh, related to that, this remote model uh, amplifies the inefficiencies of the more traditional model based on instruction lecture. Uh, so uh, that amplification makes more evident what doesn't work. And it mm -hmm. means uh, I expect also the faculty or uh, professors, teachers, realize that they have to change some stuff. And when they come back to face-to-face, -to -face, they will not continue doing that. And there will be more pressure also from the students. Then um, also, I think that uh, with all having all the children and the uh, young people in house and having to help them, the parents help them during their studies, I, I expect they to realize that uh, uh, the, important, the importance or a revalorization of teaching or what it means to be a, a teacher. So I expect also a valorization because I believe that the, the teachers are the heroes of this uh, of these pandemics. They did a lot of things. And also um, because uh, this lockdown has made us all staying home and there's a lot of things that happen when you're at home, uh, we'll need more emotional uh, health. So I expect that there will be more tools, methodologies, meditation, wellness, etc. To emotional well-being, that I expect them also to last. Makes a lot of sense. Krista, your final, final, final remarks for this session. What are your expectations? What are the expectations of the team at Ingenie? Mm, yeah, I think. I mean, I've seen a lot of comments come through that are echoing the sentiment, but it's just yeah. you know the sort of the the gap is is going to get wider. It seems you know for. Yeah. Uh, those those at the bottom of the pyramid are unfortunately going to be even further behind after these lockdown periods are are over. Um, you know, those who didn't have access to high quality digital learning platforms or or other resources, ed tech resources, you know, are they're at a major dis disadvantage now. So, I mean, my hope, I, I don't know if this will be the reality, but my hope is that there will be more more solutions that are specifically targeting those individuals at the bottom of the pyramid and, and you know, making very specific attempts to to close that gap, um, mm. you know, and, and help those individuals who, who would have been been suffering the most during this period, um, especially through through a lot of, you know, the SADC region, South Africa specifically has, has been hit really hard by this lockdown. We've had like a, a pretty extreme, one of the most extreme lockdown periods I've, I've heard of. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so, so kids have been out of school for, for a really, really long time without access to, to real education. So hopefully we can, we can do something about it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, we're, we're nearly out of time. So I'm just gonna um, close out with this final poll if um, the team can throw this poll up and if you can all please respond here online. What, what are your thoughts on the extent to which the traditional system of education will change as a result of COVID-19? You've heard from the panel, but, but what are your thoughts? Do you think there'll be very little change to the traditional system? It'll be business as usual. Do you think there'll be some change, partly change, um, or do you think it'll be very significant change, systemic and, and entire system-wide change? We'll close out. Okay, <laughs> nobody thinks there'll be very little change. It looks like we're optimistic. <laughs> That's good. We're That's good. Uh, yeah. That's what we're we want. We're we we want. <laughs> we need to be optimistic. After what we just heard, I mean, it saddens me hearing about that uh, why we, we cannot afford to have widening inequality we cannot afford to have widening in access to education we cannot afford for it to be any more expensive than it already is and i think that's part of why we saw some of the comments that we did is whilst technology is not a panacea for everything and sometimes a teacher under a tree with a well-formed radio format of pedagogy could have a, a massive impact technology doesn't have to be an ai chatbot. I think a lot of people are, are, are thinking of and turning to the work that, that the three of you are doing at, at Tech Labs at Ingini, at Pearson Ventures. They're, they're hoping that um, we will find and will encourage, you know, high efficacy, high impact education technology that's going to bridge some of these gaps. Um, any thoughts just as you, each of you see this poll? It looks like we're 50% of people expect significant change, significant change. Mm -hmm. Just under 50 expect some change, but there's still 7% who think it'll be back to business as usual. Any tiny comments from each of you as we wrap up? Yeah, I think it's it's consistent with with our conversation. I think there there will certainly be change and it seems like most most people in the audience agree with that. It's just about what, to what extent that, that change will be. So yeah, who, who knows, I guess at this point, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to find out. Peppy? Well, uh, I think that uh, this crisis has been a, a tragedy for in, in many sense, uh, but it's also an, an opportunity of uh, accelerating change. And uh, if we, um, are able to take that opportunity and not as a problem but as a challenge and opportunity uh, we can we can expect to uh, accelerate change in education that we all agree that we need fantastic owen any takeaways microphone <laughs> sorry about that i'm so used to me yeah, I think at a, at a high level, what this is really forcing people to do is think education is a lot of things, you know, a big education is getting kids meals, it's providing emotional support, it's having a place for kids to go where parents are at work, it's about educating them in society, it's about preparing for jobs. And these are all very different obligations. And it's why teachers jobs are basically impossible. Um, but also sometimes really so rewarding, because you get to touch all those different um, all those different aspects. But I think that in the past, we kind of, even though it's this real hodgepodge of responsibilities, we wouldn't think about why we're putting all this on teachers or kind of why these are all tangled together. And so I think that with all these stresses, um, it's kind of forcing people to rethink which parts of these pieces go together. Mm. Um, and so it's allowing people to almost go back to first principles in a way that if things were just chugging along as normal, it would, it would never happen. So I think that that is kind of the, the, uh, the moment that, that we're living through. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna close out. I wanna thank everyone who joined us for this, uh, this session. We really appreciate um, all of your comments and questions. Really wanna thank um, the three of you. You are so wonderful. Pepe, thank you so much for the work you do at Tech Labs. 
Krista, thank God for Ginny, thank God for you and the team working across Africa to drive innovation. And Owen, um, same, same, mate. The work that you're doing at Pearson Ventures and supporting teams around the world is is just so important. So really encourage everyone, if you haven't already researched, Googled, checked out these teams, please do so for ideas, inspiration, connectivity. And thanks again to our partners at WISE for such an awesome session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Patrick. It, it was extremely informative, and I mean, it, it's unbelievable all the, the numbers uh, we've seen. And Patrick, I, I want to keep you for a little, sure. maybe a minute or two, and and I wanna I wanna deep dive a little bit more on the on the last poll because uh, the results are quite you know revealing. Uh, so the COVID. Everyone agree on the COVID-19 that has sparked the systematic change. But but I was curious when you asked the question to the panelists, you know, no one wanted to, to jump in and, and you know, and, and say whatever you think was the forecast. What, what, why do you think the reaction was, was very... Uh... Reserved or, yeah. I, 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 this, this is really different. And we've, we saw this with our panel before. Um, COVID and as it was breaking is it was only six months ago that actually very few people thought education would change. We, we've panelled many people on our global scenarios for 2030. Only 50% of 4,000 executives in education around the world thought education would change at all by 2030. That was before COVID. There's a, there's a, and there was some great comments. There's an incredible inertia. And it's not about pointing fingers about who's fault it is for not change or who it's just this is a moment to really really come together and to 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 reimagine just as you've themed this um you know this this wonderful event is is let's think about how we can give access to those you know kids in villages in africa who are sitting by a radio under a tree with a teacher you know and those kids who are using immersive reality to you know explore biology and, and cells that higher education. I just think that it's really it's really a shock to our system. And I think everyone on this um, event really hopes that we can turn that shock into a really positive change for education at a systemic level around the world. And I, I can see that optimism in the poll here. Yeah, no, that's that's terrific. And and once again, thank you very much, you and Maria, for the work you do. It's it's just really informative. All the all the number then and the graph you, you guys prepared. Uh, thank you once again. This is because a lot of people were, were a lot of people could. I, I don't know if if some of the audience were completely aware of of those. You know, how, which sector right. will be getting the changes? What what will be accelerated? And and that was really informative the way you 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 prepared it. So once again, uh, it's it's a pleasure to have you as a partner. We we look forward to continue the, the adventure of, of organizing Absolutely. around different parts yeah. of the world. I hope uh, we will come back to that soon. Uh, for now, I wish you to stay uh, well, and uh, we we keep this conversation. We're muted, but. <laughs> uh, well, I am happy now to move to the next uh, segment of uh, the final session today. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, different sessions at WISE uh, were moderated by, uh, by our incredible team. So the next session, uh, hear my story, uh, or how do we bridge the digital and economic uh, divides, will be moderated by a young talent that joined uh, WISE very recently, uh, less than a year. Uh, Thana Al Salabi is a program officer uh, in the Innovation and Quality and Access track and manages the WISE Awards. Uh, after leaving the world of academic research, Thana joined WISE uh, to work on bringing recognition and support to organizations that innovatively work to increase inclusion and access to education around the world. I'm very happy to let 
uh, Sana moderate the session and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elias. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, welcome to the Hear My Story segment of the third day of WISE's Education Disrupted, Education Reimagined virtual event. While many have called the COVID-19 virus the great equalizer, we have witnessed that the resources available to respond to it across all sectors is unfortunately anything but equal. Speakers in this session will share their experiences and insights of how to bridge the digital and economic divide that this virus has exacerbated all across the education sector. First, to share his experience, we have Jean-Pierre Mutambarungu. Jean-Pierre is the founding dean of faculty at Kepler. Prior to his current role, he was the academic uh, campus director, College for America and Innovations at Kepler, and a teacher of English and Social Studies at Ruamagana Lutheran School. He's passionate about innovative education initiatives that support disadvantaged communities to access quality education. I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Um, the floor is yours, jump here if you are ready. Don't worry, Sana, everyone will join. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I was just having a second to see um, if you um, or online events. So <laughs> we're lining up the speakers and very soon they will join. Well, in the meantime, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please feel free to uh, write them in the chat and please share your thoughts about all your, um, everything you've heard the past couple of days on Wise Tweets. We'd be really interested to hear um, what insights really stood out to you. And I'm sure this session is gonna be full of many important ones, um, specifically on the increasing um, access gap that, is ha that has been exacerbated by uh, the COVID virus. So, is Jean-Pierre, I think Jean-Pierre is on. Can you hear us, Jean-Pierre? Now, as much as we talk about the role of technology, things like this always show that there's always limits um, to technological uh, gatherings, but it's still better than um, the climate impact of having to fly all around um, and the kind of climate costs that that can have. But we're still really fortunate to be able to hear the insights from people around the world, um, including Jean-Pierre, who's about to join us, I think. Okay, I think Jean-Pierre is having technical difficulties. So instead, we're gonna switch the order up a bit and move on uh, to another really amazing speaker that we're, I'm really excited to hear from, uh, Sam Butters, who uh, runs the Fair Education Alliance in the UK. The Fair Education Alliance is the UK's largest and most influential education coalition tackling inequalities in the education system. The uh, Alliance unites over 150 organizations from diverse sectors and geographies to work together to ensure that no child's educational success is determined by their socioeconomic background. The Fair Education Alliance achieves this through driving collective action and scaling impactful solutions and influencing policy. I'm really interested to hear what Sam has to say. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sana, um, and hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so as Sana said, my name is Sam Butters, and I'm the CEO of the Fair Education Alliance here in the UK. Um, so we're a coalition of around 170 organisations who each individually are focused on tackling the deep inequalities between richer and poorer students within the UK education system. And our members are um, education institutions, uh, charities and social enterprises, not-for-profits, 
um, policy organizations and businesses. And the reason we come together is we believe that we need to work together on the collective system change that's needed to tackle these inequalities that's just not possible and hasn't been possible with us each working alone. So today I really wanted to talk a little bit about um, the inequalities um, that are pervasive in the UK education system, but recognizing that really is a story that plays out in all countries across the world and also between countries as well. Um, and then specifically, I wanna talk about how the digital divide has um, always been um, a key component of that inequality and a key driver of it and how COVID-19 has um, exacerbated that even further and also made it more visible than we've ever seen it before in the way that digital divide creates and worsens the inequalities in society. And then finally, I wanted to share a couple of reflections about what that means in terms of um, tackling inequalities and the fact that the digital divide is such a core pillar of that, what that means for those of us who are thinking about tackling inequality and those of us who are thinking about digital as a solution for improvements in education. So to begin with, um, the inequalities in the UK education system, let me paint a picture of, of what that is. So um, we, as the Fair Education Alliance, produce a report on what the inequalities are between richer and poorer students um, in the UK system on an annual basis. And to paint a picture, last year's report, so pre-coronavirus, um, children from lower income families across the, across the country were on average a year and a half behind their wealthier peers um, when they came to leave school and do their final exams at age 16. Um, and that was up to two years behind on average in certain areas of the country, um, like the north of the country where I'm where I'm from. Um, they're also um, children from lower income families are more likely to be excluded for behavior issues. Um, after school, they are much less likely to go to university. They're more likely to be unemployed. And, and the, those ramifications are onwards into um, into their lives. And, and also, obviously, this is not a new picture and it's one that we know well um, right around the world. But shockingly, that was actually progress. Um, so since 2011, the gap had been closing um, because of collective efforts and because of um, the role that the education, um, that schools were playing in tackling those um, inequalities in education. And um, so the gap had closed by about 36%. But um, coronavirus has, has happened. And um, the really um, devastating um, rapid evidence that we're seeing is that the school closures um, through lockdown of the last three months in England are expected to reverse 10 years of progress in closing those attainment gaps. So we're basically going to be back to 2011 um, levels of inequalities between rich and poor because of um, the, the school closures that we've already seen, let alone the impact that might continue um, as we as we return to a new normal. So that is obviously a horrendous picture um, of inequality and it's for a range of reasons. Um, I think, you know, when you imagine a typical um, family with a, from a low income background in, in the UK, you can expect um, quite a small living arrangement, perhaps um, difficulty with Wi-Fi connections or data, probably not that much um, uh, working space. There may, may have been parents working from home, so there's a lack of quiet space um, for children to work and their parents to work. Probably families working multiple jobs, um, so there's lack of support. Versus a more affluent family who might have a whole um, extra room that's devoted to being a classroom or a playroom with paint um, uh, resources and pens and paper. And that's not even coming on to the basic um, access to a laptop um, or a tablet to learn on. And during um, our lockdown um, in, in England, uh, though most of the interventions for education um, were um, moved online. And I'm sure that's been the case right across the world. Um, so the government um, uh, encouraged the creation and supported the creation of an online learning academy called Oak Academy. Um, there was um, encouragement for, and schools led the way in such an incredible um, feat of, of teachers really are the heroes of, of this virus in, in moving lessons online. But to access those, um, you need a tablet or a laptop. Um, and 
actually teachers um, have told us in some of the most disadvantaged areas of the UK that up to 60 to 70 percent of their students just the families do not have that tablet um, or that laptop to learn from. And research has shown that therefore 81 percent of those without IT are not accessing, accessing any form of online learning at all. So on top of um, the kind of disadvantage gap that already exists, there's a simple lack of access for so many families to any education that has been delivered through through the coronavirus lockdown period. Um, and uh, as a result, we've seen that only 62% um, 62 62 of vulnerable children are not accessing um, any of that online learning. And there's been massive variation between um, the private schools, um, uh, which is the most affluent children in the UK, um, receiving um, the most education through this period and the least disadvantaged pupils um, in the most deprived areas um, receiving the least access. And that's simply because of the ownership of a laptop um, in those families. So what does this mean? Um, well, the obvious thing has been in the short term, um, we have, as the Fair Education Alliance, pushed for the kind of sticking plaster solution of getting technology to as many young people um, from poorer backgrounds as quickly as possible. Um, and the government has, um, to an extent, responded. Certain groups of young people have been offered laptops on loan during the period. Um, however, there's been um, huge implementation challenges with that. The actual logistics of getting tech to young people is, is, is very challenging at speed. And then even with the laptops, there's challenges with data and Wi-Fi um, and internet access um, in the infrastructure. So reflecting, I think I have two big um, uh, reflections and concerns from what we've seen during, during this period. I think we have a saying in the UK that um, a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. And I've been thinking about the fact that addressing the digital divide is not just for lockdown, but it's for life. <laughs> we, the digital divide existed long before um, coronavirus and before um, lockdown and, and, and as well been at home and it's going to exist still afterwards and my worry is that although this has made it really visible and really obvious because schools have been closed and children have either had a laptop or not had a laptop um, that's still been a huge um, in, uh, exacerbation of inequalities um, beyond uh, this lockdown period um, and probably a huge factor in inequalities before and will continue to be afterwards. So just because it's been made visible during this period, I think that as we um, move forward and in the last panel, um, I know there was conversation about um, increased expectation of blended learning models and more learning online um, and uh, obviously increase in ed tech and virtual learning. We need to be absolutely cognizant of the fact that this digital divide will exacerbate inequalities unless we first um, address that kind of access um, problem uh, for, for disadvantaged families. And, and obviously, um, my story is about the situation in the UK and that division of access, but I think it very much will play out globally as well. And then secondly, and my final reflection um, to offer is I am very, I think, Alarm bells ring for me when um, the, the, the conversations about reimagining education understandably um, focus on innovation in ed tech and kind of AI and virtual learning. Um, but there is something so much more basic um, in, in terms of uh, access to that technology and, uh, and the infrastructure to make the most of the use of that technology. But I think as we think about um, and I welcome kind of the reimagining of education with that use of, of ed tech and virtual learning. But it has to be done with the utmost focus on the fact that millions and, and probably billions around the world, um, millions in the UK, billions around the world of children will just not have that access. And how can we um, have that in mind as we as we think about reimagining education and tech at the heart of that? Thank you, Thana. Thank you so much, Sam, for all your insights. Um, I had a question come to mind um, based on everything that you're talking about, specifically if um, you're seeing a lot of, of the initiatives happening are plaster solutions of giving potentially 
giving tech or um, trying to loan tech and their issues with that. But what about the digital literacy divide? Um, what do you think can be done for parents um, to support parents and supporting their children um, in this digital divide as well? Because I imagine that would also be um, a limit to quality access of education if learning is done at home. Absolutely. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic point, Thana, because almost what we've seen in terms of these sticking plaster solutions is addressing the very basic of the hierarchy of needs of simply the access to the laptop. But then even with a laptop, there's such a digital um, divide in terms of ability to use that tech, um, uh, the, the, um, the support from parents to um, be able to guide and advise on education and education particularly through a digital platform. Um, and those inequalities are playing out. So I think, um, so, so I think it's a really good point. I think that the, the kind of basic um, alarm bell for me is just the, the literal lack of access. But then I think absolutely to make the point that even when we've addressed that first access point, there's then the, the um, initiatives for, for creating equal engagement and being, again, cognizant of that in the design of anything we do. And my, and my real fear is that um, the design of, of initiatives for education are so... Um, born out of a, a certain demographic and a certain demographic who are digitally literate and who are um, kind of comfortable with webinars like this, um, that we could easily underestimate and uh, overestimate um, the the uh, the kind of equality of, of that skill set and that engagement. Um, so I think that's really important for everyone as well. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, everything that you've said is so insightful and I'm sure it's given a lot for our um, audience to think over. Um, so again, thank you so much for your, um, everything that you've said. Um, up next, uh, we will have uh, Craig D'Souza um, in a short Q&A session. Um, Craig is a well, uh, Craig is a seasoned results producing leader with experience in steering and directing all aspects of risk management, security processes, investigations, and intelligence frameworks. He has extensive international skills through working, traveling, and living in uh, North America, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and currently uh, Craig leads an elite team of a global managers, investigators, analysts, and protective service professionals at Facebook positioned across the globe. Um, so I have a lot of really interesting questions to ask you, Craig, based on your experience um, in this moment. So I think, I guess I'll start by asking um, a really broad question of what do you think uh, the role of the tech sector is um, in helping limit the digital divide to accessing education um, in high or low resource contexts, uh, like Sam was mentioning? Yeah, thanks. First of all, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Um, the opportunity to speak to all of you. Great question, Thana. I think I think the way I look at it, and there's been a lot of conversations today about um, access to technology. When I think about access to technology, I think about it much more from a foundational standpoint. So picking up on a point that Sam raised, it's the infrastructure piece of it. So there's a lot of companies that play very well in the hardware space. Apple is one of them. Um, of course, there's socioeconomic factors that limit people's ability to have that hardware in their hand. For us at Facebook, one of the things that we're focused on, and it's really focused on our mission, is to build community and make the world more open and connected. So using that as the foundational linchpin, we have experimented with a ton of different network and infrastructure capabilities to bring people online that are in areas of the world that don't have the ability to be online. So by way of an example, I heard on the previous panel, someone talking about Africa, and that's been a big push for us. We've tried with, um, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have, have, are familiar with what Google's doing in terms of balloons and, and um, some of the um, drones that we could have up. We, we've experimented with drones and we've actually now pushed into low earth orbit satellites. So we call them LEO satellites. It's ourselves and a bunch of other tech companies that are actually hand in hand working on this technology because we understand the byproduct of this has implications far beyond what one tech company can do. It's the modern day space race, if you think about it in that sense as well. So in a sense, you know, Amazon might be doing something extremely well, we would focus on something else. And then we would combine those two technologies to then 
move the technology forward. So I was a lot more, um, I would say reserved in talking about this in the past four to five years, because sometimes when you talk about satellites and, and, and some of these things, people are just, it blows their mind because there's, it, it's hard to conceptualize how that actually becomes tangible. I will say certainly over the past one year to two years, this has become way more tangible. There's a number of a low, Earth sat, low Earth orbit satellites that are in our constellation right now. I predict probably in the next five years, you'll see upwards of a thousand, just to put that in perspective. That gives us the ability to go beyond even drones, if you think about it from that perspective. So we won't even you know, have the um, capacity to just hit Africa. We could hit Africa and parts of Asia, um, so on and so forth. So that constellation is something that I'm looking at uh, very closely. And then when I bring it down a notch, there is also a ton of work across the tech sector in terms of subsea cable bills. So to connect continents across the globe and put people really on the map, I think that's where you start. Because if we start with you putting someone on a 5G network or giving them access to a computer or a laptop or so on and so forth, there are so many challenges, like I mentioned, and barriers to entry. I think for us, we're really well positioned given the capital that we have and access that we have to go after this from an infrastructure standpoint and then just let players that's, that play really well in those spaces, including educational institutions, uh, go after you know actually taking that technology and then putting it into the hands of people that really, really need it. I don't think we have that, um, that level of expertise yet. Um, well, actually, since we're talking about experts, expertise, I'd love to tap into some of your expertise on security and asking what issues of security do you think need to be addressed as technology becomes even more prominent um, component of learning. Uh, as we've spoken throughout today in the past two days, there is a huge move towards tech. Um, so what do you think now and in a post-COVID world, what should organizations keep in mind in terms of uh, security when using all of these technologies? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and, you know, I've heard a lot of comments today about education and people feeling that they're, you know, they missed the ball or they're 10 years behind or 20 years behind. Um, I would take a collective breath because that is not something that's foreign or um, it's pretty agnostic to industry. So I've seen that in the corporate sector. I've seen that in the public sector and certainly in the education sector. I think this COVID situation has forced us to face the acuteness of what that disparity looks like. So as a result of that, now we're actually looking at how do we actually fill this gap and put people in a capacity or in a framework where they can interact with each other. There was also a lot of archaic systems, whether you look at education, public sector or private sector, that kept traditional systems in place for a variety of reasons, monetary, access, location, um, you know, and there's some thinking in there too that needs to be modernized. I think for me, when I'm thinking about the safety and security, it really goes back to a blended learning environment. Um, I'm very bullish on technology, obviously, based on, on who I work with and what I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the last time I spoke at a WISE event, I talked about virtual reality and that actually being in many ways archaic and it was really augmented reality that a lot of companies are, are looking at because that gives us the ability to interact through this forum, but maybe with a virtual reality headset and we can see the audience and we can interact seamlessly. That technology is not that far away. It's actually right at our doorstep. We're experimenting with it at scale now post COVID because we realized very quickly we became a utility. So if you think about Italy, for example, who got really hit very hard at the beginning of this COVID situation, um, they use Facebook as a utility and WhatsApp to actually call people, tell people that they were safe, so on and so forth. So when I think about that blended learning environment that we're gonna go back to, because I don't think we're gonna go full uh, digitized because people generally are social beings, there's gonna be an element of safety. So when people say going back to the new normal, I look at it as going back to the new safe. So what does that mean? From a physical standpoint, that means social distancing, temperature screening. Um, when you look at the classroom setting, that's gonna change forever, I firmly believe, because I don't think we're, we're out of this uh, COVID cycle probably until we get immunization and antibody testing, which I think is, is probably a ways away. Um, in addition to the actual tech piece of cyber. So you've seen a lot of platforms that um, very quickly became used in both a corporate capacity and a private capacity. 
And then there was a ton of information about security risks around that. So there's still a lot of work to be done in those areas. I would look at what are the platforms right now that are focusing on end-to-end -end encryption? And are they overlaying some kind of technology for seamless integration? Those are the ones that I think have legs as we go forward into that blending learning environment where they can not affect the educational institution that just knows that that area much more um, in depth and, and, and well than, than we do, but can they overlay this technology and, and look at education modernization as opposed to taking over that segment of the market? I, I, I got some questions from the chat that I wanna push you a little further on this. Um, sure. Do you think there are any security concerns we should be worried about in terms of when with children? Um, dealing with all these technologies, because if they're going to be the end user um, moving forward in a lot of these uh, ventures, uh, do you think that there are more uh, security concerns we need to be worried about, or are they like another kind, any kind of other end user? Yeah, I think you know certainly the, the children. It's, it's it's for sure you, you should be concerned about that, and and obviously based on children being vulnerable, and I would say even the elderly for that for that matter, that are not as well versed as we would be in technology adoption or use, there's there should be an expectation of people in security to make sure that those two groups at either end of the spectrum um, are taken care of when we put security first. And it's almost privacy and security by design as opposed to thinking of it as an afterthought. The caveat there or the asterisk is we don't have a choice. I think we're gonna have to push people into this environment Otherwise, I think if we're having this conversation, you know, four years from now, when we come out of this COVID cycle, I think it's a different conversation that we have with ourselves when we're looking in the mirror. So I think if we actually take advantage of this moment, take the key learnings that may have been, you know, antiquated and archaic in nature over the past decade or two decades, or I heard a previous speaker saying 800 years for, you know, the way things have been going. Um, I think it's a matter of taking that and pushing towards it. So I don't think we have a choice of whether children get online or whether they're going to use technology. I think they do it way better than we do um, already. It's just a matter of how do we do that in a safe manner. So I think over the past three to four years, certainly from a chief security officer perspective and or technology perspective, security and privacy is just a byproduct of what people expect to get online or use a product. So that's just something that I see against the backdrop of some of the privacy regulations that you're seeing all over Europe and North America and Africa, I think those two things go hand in hand and it's gonna be, it's gonna result in, in technology that has that focus first, but we have a responsibility to bring everyone into the 21st century, so to speak, to give them the access to tools that equalizes things. What I worry about in this situation is we come out of this with hopefully some more humanism and care for each other, but, I worry about us as human beings moving on to the next crisis, which can happen very quickly. And I think we have to take a collective pause, dig deep and look at what we can learn from this and how do we keep this as a consistent drumbeat in education moving forward, as opposed to thinking of this as a fleeting moment and then just going on to the next thing. Thank you. Those are really insightful thoughts, um, especially considering that like, what is the move, what is the direction in the next crisis? Because, this, this one has shown us that we clearly weren't prepared. Um, but I do have a question about kind of the response of the tech sector to this uh, crisis. Um, has it changed the appetite of the tech sector to support education in any way? Or um, has it just um, kind of accelerated and put it on steroids? What would you say would be your opinion? Yeah, being from yeah good question. I think, I think generally every tech company has their foot in the water, so to speak, with education. Um, I think there's a key understanding that we don't understand education to the extent that, you know, a wise organization would with decades and decades of experience. And nor do we want to replace that system or do we want to replace the traditional education system? I think it's more about how do we overlay and combine the two? Because I think that's the piece of it that 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 is the secret sauce. It's, you know, I've seen conversations have been part of debates where it's is tech getting way too into one segment of the market or not? Um, are we displacing people? Is there market competition without an understanding of that market? I think from a leadership level at Facebook, certainly we always pause, look, talk to people in the industry that have deep understanding and knowledge 
And then we look at, are there opportunities where we can plug in and force multiply? And I think that's the key. Um, and that's what I'm seeing across, across the tech sector now. There's certainly a push to reach more people in this type of context, because this is gonna be the new safe, the new normal. Um, because the deprogramming of people to, to, to interact with each other, I think is gonna take a long time, even in spite of vaccinations and immunization, like I talked about. I think there's also a factor where people need to feel safe in their heads to then interact. So for me, it's how do we inject our process into that traditional education model and system? And then how do we complement each other to then force multiply the efforts to, to actually push this forward um, and then keep that momentum going over the long term? Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, this has been a really interesting conversation for me and I'm sure for our audience as well. We really appreciate your insights. Um, and I'm sure uh, the audience, if you guys have any thoughts, please share them uh, with us on Wise Tweets. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Greg. Um, now I'm going to thank everyone for listening to the Hear My Story segment and hand it over to my colleague, Elias. Dana, you, you're, you're terrific. Thank you very much for this moderation. I am happy now to move to the, the last panel, the last session before the closing of our uh, three days forum. Uh, this, uh, this dialogue, this is, this is what we call uh, the specialist dialogue. We're going we're gonna to have experts from the private and uh, public sector that will explore how we can build sustainable cross-sector uh, cross coalition and leverage the expertise of each sector so that our education systems become more agile and inclusive. Uh, the moderator of this session is uh, a great guy who is behind, uh, behind an amazing platform uh, called Concordia. He's the CEO and co-founder of Concordia. So Matt Swift, uh, chairman and CEO of Concordia, he, since its inception in 2011, Matthew and his business partner, Nicola uh, Logothesis, has grown Concordia into a reputable and impactful nonpartisan organization dedicated to actively creating, elevating, and sustaining cross-sector partnerships for positive social impact. Matthew's passion for entrepreneurship, global affairs, and collaboration has led to Concordia being recognized as the preeminent global hub for cro cross-sector partnerships. Under Matthew leadership, Concordia has hosted numerous global summits and practitioner uh, level convening. Concordia has now held nine annual summits in New York City, with the most recent in September 2019, the largest and most inclusive nonpartisan forum on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. Concordia has also held regional summits in Miami, Bogota, London, Madrid, and Athens. Matthew has brought together an impressive group of international leaders to serve on Concordia's Leadership Council, which comprised of head of states from around the world and top CEOs from multinational corporations. It is a great honor for us to be a partner of uh, Concordia, and uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us, Matthew. Elias, thank you very, very much. And I would like to first thank WISE uh, for hosting this incredible series of discussions over the past few days. Uh, it has been an uplifting and frankly, very refreshing uh, to listen to all the good work being done by ed tech, practitioners, and education specialists to approach the challenge of COVID-19 and hear how we are adapting to the environment we now find ourselves in. Before I introduce my fellow panelists for this discussion and to get started with the conversation, I want to take a moment to introduce the first poll that will be circulated during this conversation. Please take a few minutes while you listen as we get going to respond to the poll. I'll ask the question twice. Please submit your answers to the poll at your convenience um, and very, very much looking forward to then kicking off the discussion. So here goes. Here's the question. What do you think the private sector can add to civil society? and the public space. I'll say it again. What do you think the private sector can add to civil society and the public space? Three months into COVID-19 pandemic, into the COVID-19 pandemic, global physical lockdown has made disruption an ongoing reality 
for three quarters of the world's education systems, schools, and students. This crisis has pushed the education sector's existing shortcomings into new territory, from learning design to equity and access. Now is a critical time for cross-sector collaboration, public-private partnerships, and a unified world. This virtual discussion will explore how we can build sustainable cross-sector collaborations and coalitions and leverage the expertise of each sector so that our education system uh, systems become more resilient, agile, and inclusive for the challenges we are currently facing and those of the future. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce two fantastic visionary innovators from the education sector joining us today. Sherry Weston serves as the president of social impact and philanthropy at Sesame Workshop, the nonprofit educational organization behind Sesame Street. Sherry has spearheaded the largest early childhood intervention in the history of humanitarian response to bring critical education to refugee, to refugee children in Syria. She also serves as a senior advisor to the organization that I co-founded, Concordia. We are also joined by Vicky Colbert, CEO of Fundacion Escuela Nueva, co-author of the worldwide renowned Escuela Nueva model. Vicky has pioneered, expanded, and sustained this educational innovation for many organizational spheres. Together, they are supercharging the ways we learn, particularly around social and emotional learning, and I'm really looking forward to diving into this discussion. All right, so first question here. Engaging students within rural or humanitarian contexts often requires the support of a number of different stakeholders. How do you ensure that you're able to reach your object objectives while still managing such a complex array of needs and capacity? Sherry, let's start with you. She's about to join. I am informed. No worries. No worries. <laughs> hey, listen, this is technology. We got to figure this out. Right? <laughs> She's about to join. No problem. No problem. And I got to say, you couldn't have a better speaker than Sherry at this point. I mean, she's about as good yeah. as it gets in terms of talking about this subject, the work that she's done and that Sesame's done, and, and um, especially around refugees is, is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Everywhere in the world, there is mm -hmm. a very impactful Sesame Workshop story. Uh, mm -hmm. That's incredible. I mean, they managed to adapt to each part of the world, and you know, it's not a copy paste of whatever they've done successfully in the U.S. Right? Yeah. So, uh, I've been to Colombia, as you know. There, there's a famous <laughs> personality of, of Spanish personality, and then in Syria as well. Uh, yes, Bassem. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. They <laughs> Hey, Bassem, Bassem spoke at uh, our Bassem. summit. Bassem, Bassem, yes, spoke. <laughs> but he spoke at uh, at our uh, summit last September, and I have to say, it was it was the first time we'd had a uh, Muppet. But I loved every minute of it. So, um, I think we're just waiting for Vicky and Sherry, so they'll be on in a minute. Um, Elias, what has been some what have been some great highlights of the uh, various sessions to you over the last few days? What have you been most proud of? Look, we had a good journey of starting at the very high policy level uh, with uh, with you know some statement from the UNESCO, Mr. Gordon Brown. Um, we moved to a little bit more to have more quality and access uh, topics, and and we connected this today with with a more of an education technology. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the highlight of today is uh, it, it, it is really the, the uh, I think we managed to understand how COVID have mm -hmm. really accelerated the reform that everyone has been talking about in education for the past ten years, but yeah. we. We needed that, you know. We needed that. We needed a push, and yeah. it, with all the with all the unfortunate things that happened with COVID, maybe mm -hmm. maybe there is an opportunity for education to to uh, you know to implement some of those. Sure. Uh, yeah. So so that's I think that's I think what 
hopefully we managed to to give to the audience today we managed to give them you know figures and and and, and real graphs of, of what is what what is happen what is could happen you know uh, immediately soon after the covid uh, situation but mm. i am not the star today when i come and speak in concordia you can ask <laughs> questions i'm happy to let you know that amal and thor are in the room and we are happy to ask them to join so we can reverse or we do this conversation this way and sounds I will keep great on the other speakers sounds great and i and 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 vicky and sherry can join whenever whenever they're able to so that's fine perfect amal thor you're welcome to join hi amal how are you hi thor Hi. Talk about going on the fly. This is good. We're we're all the good news is we're all ready for anything that happens on a uh, on a digital summit. How are you I'm both happy doing? to be the backup speaker. <laughs> well, not the backup at all. We're just uh, quickly shifting shifting gears. But um, uh, you know, let me let me start and let me let me uh, 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 first uh, talk a little bit about the two of you so that everybody knows. Um, the two great visionaries and innovators that we're talking to um, right now. So really excited that you both are are here, um, and and I think that it would be it would be great for both of you. Um, let's start with Amel to share a little bit about the work you're doing right now, and then we'll go right into the questions. So Amel, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm CEO of the Education Outcomes Fund. This is an initiative that came out of the work of the Education Commission. Uh, in partnership with the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. And basically, look, today um, alone the OECD countries, we know they spend 10 trillion alone in education and health. And the work from the commission has showed us that actually by 2030, and this was before COVID, so yeah. this thing going to be worse, we are basically going to fail half of the world's children. Um, and for this is huge. You know, I used a metaphor that not everyone likes, but I said, like, it's, it's it's like you book a, a you know a ticket to fly to New York uh, from London, let's say, and only fifty percent of the time you land in New York, and fifty percent of the time you land somewhere else. You know, like how mm -hmm. long will this company be in business? And that's what's mm -hmm. happening in education right now. So we set out to say we want um, you know two things. We want one um, you know to spend the money we're spending now more effectively, so to achieve sure. more learning, not just fifty percent of the children all of the children and 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 secondly also bring in uh new finance and, and new money um also beyond let's say the government money because all of those trillions in the capital market sitting there how can we attract how can we make actually social and developmental challenges more attractive for private investors to invest mm -hmm. and take also the risk so not that private companies um, you know, kind of make profits and dump all externalities and society for government to collect them, but to kind of have an active role. Um, and so we set up to, to to do this fund. So it's a one million mm. dollar fund that pays for results only once they are achieved, um, and in this crowds in a private capital ahead and future. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But maybe one thing that that I can say is we set out to build a fund. And what we found out actually is what created a new form of partnership uh, mm -hmm. for the public mm -hmm. purpose, which is for the children and happy to share more later. No, that's fantastic. And I am excited to sort of dig a little bit deeper into that. I want to take a moment at the beginning of this conversation. I asked everybody that's watching, uh, I asked them to answer a poll question. Um, and so before we go to you, Thor, I want to talk through the results of that poll, because I think it's very relevant to the conversation that we all are having right now. Uh, the question, just to repeat that for everybody who's watching, the question was, what do you think the private sector can add to the civil society and public spaces? Um, and the one that came in on top was greater opportunities to engage beneficiaries who no longer define education solely by traditional institutions and systems. Almost 50% uh, responded immediately with that. What came in second to that, creative solutions to longstanding problems within the mm -hmm. sector. That was 31%. And third was more agile methods of resource mobilization, which was 17%. And at 2%, the private sector should remain at the periphery of education. Mm -hmm. So I think that's awfully relevant to the conversation that we 
are having. Before we dive into uh, those questions and the reaction to that poll, Thor, would love to hear, uh, would really welcome you to introduce yourself uh, to those, uh, to the viewers and, and hear a little bit about what you're working on. Yeah, of course, of course. Well, I'm a CEO at uh, EdTech Denmark, which is uh, a Danish uh, coalition of, uh, of uh, stakeholders in, in the EdTech industry. Uh, we've uh, had a goal from, from day one to, to try and, uh, and uh, take all of the, the, the different uh, stakeholders in the, in the business of developing mm -hmm. good education and, and, and gather them in, in, in one room around one, uh, one topic of uh, how we, we, we best uh, qualify our education uh, through the means of, of digital uh, learning. And that's why we have uh, we have created uh, EdTech Denmark, uh, and uh, and we house both uh, EdTech uh, companies, uh, research, mm -hmm. and, uh, analytics uh, organizations, and of course uh, the, the uh, schools, uh, school sector, and uh, the entire educational sector. Uh, so so we've we've tried to to combine those three uh, stakeholders. Mm -hmm in this process of developing uh, Im improvement uh, of education. Uh, and that's uh, that's our main goal. Got it, okay, well, that's that's fantastic. That, that And so that's a great lead into the first question that I have for the two of you. But let's start with you, Thor. Traditional approaches to the development of education systems have proven to be lengthy and in some cases ineffective. What can the private sector bring to this field beyond funding and what changes do you see as a result of their increased participation? So, well, Thor, can, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. It's it's funny because uh, a lot of uh, of uh, the new ed tech companies, small startups, uh, come from from people from within the educational sector who have seen uh, something lacking or seen something that that could be improved on. So so uh, in my view, uh, the, the the private sector is uh, is very very valuable of of, uh, of focusing uh, to help us focus on what's uh, what kind of possibilities there are in, in developing uh, the educational sector. Mm -hmm. Am I any comments to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I would like to, to provoke a bit by saying I don't like this, you know, public sector is uh, ethical, but potentially ineffective and inefficient and not innovative. And the private sector is super innovative, efficient, but potentially immoral. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, and, and then to have this dogma, I, I don't, I think we need a new form of partnership. Um, this is for me the big thing because um, I, I, I am a big believer in government. I think government need to be delivered to their citizens, need to be held accountable. Um, I've been minister in a government myself and I know we can't do it by ourselves. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we know that. So the question is how can we work together? The problem is that traditional, let's say PPP, you know, private public partnership models, um, you know, have their limitation. They've been mainly about governments outsourcing things and the finance bit sure. and, and mainly building a bridge you can put your name on. But when you look at education or health or, you know, the yeah. human capital side of things, it's been tougher. And so I'm, I'm writing an article right now called PPP is dead, long live PPP, which uh, the second PPP is partnership for public purpose, because I think we don't need you know, just to say, okay, the private sector is going to come and fly in and save everyone and yeah. reform education in Nigeria, Brazil, India, and China in one year. You know, like it's just, you know, the, the question is, you know, uh, we need a partnership with multi stakeholders. So there's civil yep. society, parents, um, you know, unions, everyone should be in it. And not for what sake? And, and I think that's the, the, you know, the public purpose has to be defined. And then every actor can, 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 can play a role. And I'm happy to share later one concrete example from Ghana or Sierra Leone where we're doing work please. on the ground with, with, with a form of partnership. You want to do it now or later? Yeah, no, please, please, we'd love to hear Yeah, that. yeah. so, um, you know, for example, we're working now, um, you know, in Sierra Leone uh, with the ministry there who um, I find amazing because, you know, David, the ministry comes and says, look, our children are failing to learn. Um, we know that like too many, like 60%, I think, at the end of primary school still can't read. And, um, you know, let's, let's try to innovate and find ways how to do that. And, and so they started an education innovation challenge where few, um, we call them service provider. These are, can be nonprofits, mm. can be also social enterprises. Um, you know, they've been trying different interventions, different things. 
and, and then with a very robust evaluation and data to find out which of these actually work. And now uh, we're working with the government of Sierra Leone to scale this with our approach, which is we hold people accountable for results, for the outcomes, mm -hmm. for the children learning, for the children being able to learn a paragraph for meaning, for example, or know what 46 minus 16 is, yeah? Mm -hmm. But not we are not telling them what the activity or intervention they have to be, because we believe that then you unleash the entrepreneurship and innovation on the ground. And mm -hmm. I, I say, I thought always being a cabinet minister in a transition phase, you know, is, is kind of the most difficult job in the world. Um, but sure. after I left the ministry, I was two years head of, um, you know, kind of think and do tank and a nonprofit. And I tell you, this is the toughest job in the world because <laughs> you are in the yeah. receiving end on everything that undermines the impact we want to achieve. You know, I have to bill every coffee cup and spend 80% monitoring, uh, writing monitoring reports. And, and, and now we're actually giving those partners. So for me, private sector is much larger. So it includes mm -hmm. not civil society, NGOs, nonprofits, social enterprises, et cetera, where mm -hmm. we're holding them accountable for the results and not for activities. And actually it helps with COVID-19 because now they can say, hmm, I have to include more ed tech or more distance mm. learning. And now I can do it. I don't have to go back to the donor and ask for 5,000 permission and change. Um, I can do it because it helps me achieve the result. But Thor, it is important though, the private sector that's at the table, there's no question there are so many advantages to the private sector being at the table, but there are some core elements that they need to have in order just to simply exist companies. So how do you merge all of those different interests, whether it's the public sector or the private sector, how do you merge all of those different interests to come to what is at the end of the day, a good output? Uh, because the, everyone is shooting for the same goal. I think all the good actors in this space from the public and private sectors are going for the same exact goal, but how do you combine all of those interests and just the basic necessity that the private sector has? Yeah, exactly, and, and and that's that's actually one of the main points that that everyone has the same goals. They want to make a great education, uh, and and that's that's the that's one of the gathering uh, factors uh, exactly. And 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 you ask uh, how how we do it and how how you could uh, how you can facilitate this, and um, and of course for the for the companies for the edtech uh, companies, it's a question about uh, is is it sellable? Uh, can we can we sell this? Uh, uh, who can we sell it to? Is it something you sell to the industry or, or foreign uh, mm. or, or what are you looking at? But but in in our point of view and what we do is actually that we when, that we co-create. So when a company uh, come, comes with a great idea for, for a new educational tool, uh, we, we, uh, we uh, pair them up with the, an educational institution and, uh, and, and, and a research institution mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. they co-create a, a new solution. And because the, the educational institution is part of this, then, then the edtech company already has some, someone to, uh, to test it on uh, because they are they they are their uh, main uh, target uh, for for delivery, uh, so they already have mm -hmm. a, an audience mm -hmm. and a, and a good uh, use case. Uh, so so uh, so they are they are winning, and of course the educational sector is winning as well in in, in this game because uh, uh, both the students uh, and the teachers at the educational institutions. Uh, Get to be on the on the front line of uh, of new technology uh, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and the latest development, and the uh, and the students uh, get to see a part of their own uh, path of education that may may uh, not uh, lead into, uh, for example, if a, if a nursing student uh, gets to 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 be part of one of these uh, co-creation um, mm -hmm. um, uh, projects. The mm -hmm. nursing student uh, might, when when she's done uh, as a student and and should be be get out and, and work as a student uh, as a nurse, she might uh, consider uh, to start a, a new uh, uh, edtech. Uh, mm -hmm. That's all, all of a sudden she she knows the the the, um, the business and she knows uh, what's mm -hmm. possible. So that's uh, so a win-win situation. No, so Thor, I mean, I think you raised some good points and that leads me to, to something I wanted to make sure um, when, when looking at the work that the two of you do, I wanted to make sure we really talked about this. 
With the pandemic globally, one of the things that I found so incredible to see is the extent of information sharing between entities, between governments and companies, between companies and other companies. In certain cases, they're direct competitors. Um, we're also seeing that within the NGO space. I know uh, at Concordia, for instance, and I can certainly also speak for our partners uh, over at WISE and the Qatar Foundation that you know we're all sharing ideas of saying, how do we execute on this? How do we How do we do these different things? But my big question is, how do we improve information sharing between the private sector and the public sector, but also just across the board? Um, when you when you really think about uh, transparency um, and you think about how it's such an op obstacle in managing cross-sectional um, coalitions, how do we break down the silos of information resources so that they can be shared in a transparent and productive way that does not interfere with what these businesses especially need to achieve. Who would like it? Thor, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, well, well what, what we're looking very much into, and, and I can see, see exactly the same uh, trend in, in the COVID uh, area, era, that, that a lot of people want to come together and share their knowledge just for the common good. That's, that's wonderful to see. Um, but, 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 but what, what we are trying to do is, uh, is to, to uh, break some of the, the more technical walls uh, between yeah. us. Uh, of course, yeah. you know that, that the whole uh, GDPR uh, issue uh, is, is something that that's, that, that often uh, breaks uh, the will of, of, of small startups because they have to, to combat with a, with a legal uh, uh, apparatus that's, that's hard to work with. So we are actually tr trying to make a lot of, uh, a lot of standards. Uh, that, that you could could uh, that 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 shouldn't be a, a barrier between us. So that, uh, that's one of the ways we are looking at. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I think that that um, there are two areas. I mean, one that you probably doing at Concordia and Wise is doing is this convening place and yeah. to manage really to convene to bring people together in room. And there are very few places where all these meet because again, you know, having had the chance to work in private sector, government and, and civil society, I used to meet sometimes all the same people, but never like across these, you know, you can, it can be quite selective. So there is a convening responsibility to bring people together, but then you have to make it real to make, to make it real. You have to work on a very concrete project. And, and um, you know, for example, in Ghana, now we're working out of school children in the North to bring them back to school and to keep them in schools learning. Um, I think, it's been really a, a kind of, I, I like though what you said about co-creation process. So um, basically you, from day one, um, you know, sometimes you feel like, I felt like we have a split personality in our team because you enter a room with investor, you have one language, you enter a room with government, another language, you enter a room with the private sector, and, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, and then we see our role at the Education Outcomes Fund as an intermediary, like in, in kind of bringing those people together in language. So we worked separately with each and then, we have milestones where we bring everyone together. And I think if we've learned something from the work we've been doing, it's, it's okay to be wrong, you know, like mm -hmm. in a way, not wait for the perfect solution, but to kind of, you know, throw something out there, a first prototype, almost like using a design thinking approach for education reform, you know, like, and then, you know, talking with everyone, say, we know it's wrong, but tell us what the 10% mm -hmm. are right. And then you, you do your tour and then again a tour and sometimes you bring them all together in one, one place. Um, so that convening is one. Secondly, is working really together on a concrete project. And the third piece is probably what we're trying to do with also Thor talked about is public knowledge. You know, like, so let's not just do Ghana. Let's say what we've learned from here, the contracts, for example, for this partnership. Can we, mm -hmm. then it took us two years with two big law firms working, you know, with us pro bono to develop them because no one has done this before. So can we take these and, and make them kind of cookie cutter so the next person who does the partnership doesn't have to figure out all those um, pieces and, you know, get all the I's dotted and T crossed and, 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 and build on that. So these are the three areas where I feel we, we are moving to make that happen. That's great. Well, um, uh, Thor and Amel, thank you very, very much for your time today. It's it's great to hear your feedback and your thoughts. And and I think one of the one of the big takeaways I take from your last comment, Amel, is is uh, we don't need to let uh, the perfect interfere with the good. And in certain cases, it's okay to just start doing and 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 get to what is the good, even with the imperfections of technology and how we're using it for education in this time during this pandemic. So thank you both very, very much. And really grateful for your time. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.
Uh, it is now my great pleasure to to bring in Sherry Weston, uh, president of social impact and philanthropy at Sesame Street, hoping that she can join. There, hey, <laughs> you finally, I, I made it. I'm so sorry. No, we've don't had, worry. We've had just... All sorts of technical difficulties, but I am um, I am sure <laughs> I am the one that is at fault. So I no, apologize. No, no, no. Hey, listen, we're we we're gonna start with the good, and then eventually we'll get all this perfect down the road, right? Um, no, no. It's not like well, I haven't done this before, but yeah. nothing, nothing worked. So I apologize. No worries. No, no, no. I, I'm just really glad that we can get to. Uh, this point in the conversation. I Before we start, Sherry, I do want to add in one more poll question to everybody watching. Okay. Um, so that poll question is, what do you think the private sector can add to civil society and the public space? Um, I'll ask it one more time. What do you think the private sector can add to civil society and the public space? Um, and so, Sherry, what we'll do is while you and I talk, we'll, that will give people an opportunity to uh, utilize the poll and 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 about those results towards the end of our conversations. Um, so Sherry, I wanna just dive right in. Um, engaging students within rural and humanitarian contexts, as you know, often requires the support of a number of different stakeholders. How do you ensure that you're able to reach your fundamental objectives while still managing such a complex array of needs and capacities? Well, it's challenging, as you can imagine, but I, I think that the most important thing is is for us to be clearly focused on those objectives and even in how we determine those objectives. So I would say mm -hmm. the first step is clearly defining the needs and making sure we understand what the most pressing needs are of children mm -hmm. that we're serving and to understand where our partners you know, what their capacity and where they're best positioned to help address those needs. So we know where we're aligned. We know where our skill sets complement one another. And, and there's a clear division of labor, if you will. So, so you know well that Sesame Workshop, you know, our expertise is creating research-based, proven educational content. Um, but we're not a direct service uh, provider. We use mass media to reach children at scale and digital and every means possible to reach children. But in order to really address these pressing needs in these crisis settings, we need other um, partners. We need the buy-in of, of ministries um, and we need direct service providers. So I'll give you, um, you know, one of the, I think, best examples Please. is, for example, in our, our humanitarian work in the Middle East, our program is called Ahlan Simpson, which means Welcome Sesame in Arabic. And our mm -hmm. key partner is the International Rescue Committee, the IRC. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the fact that what Sesame is doing is creating local Arabic content designed to meet the needs of children in this region. And those are, you know, that's delivered through mass media at scale, through broadcast, through digital, through mm -hmm. every means possible. Um, and we are then combining that, combining that content that is also about educational resources that are designed to um, facilitate learning through play and promote engagement with caring adults, which is so critically important to children. And so if you combine that now with the IRC's mm -hmm. direct services, so it's home visits, it's learning centers, it's healthcare clinics, we're empowering them, them with these tools. Um, and that allows us to, you know, um, really bring early education and nurturing care to mm -hmm. millions of children across Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. Um, but, but, I, but I mentioned at first the importance of defining those needs. And so I think it's mm -hmm. important to emphasize that we, we always start with really clear needs assessment. I mean, with Sesame, mm -hmm. research is part of our DNA. And yeah. it's not only that needs assessment and formative research, but again, the partners in the region are so important because we rely on local advisories. Mm -hmm. We rely on um, our, our academics, um, practitioners. For instance, yeah. when we did our needs assessment in the region, um, it, the clear feedback came back that, that the biggest challenge for children was the emotional, regulating emotions, um, mm -hmm. being able to identify emotions in order to manage emotions. And so after gaining this research, we, we held content advisories in Lebanon and, and Jordan. And again, with practitioners, academics, um, 
we learned that this was a consistent issue across the board, not only for displaced Syrian children, but also mm -hmm. for those in host communities. And that allowed us to create a clear curriculum with a with a curricular goal about um, bringing the emotional ABCs, if you will, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Help and families manage those um, challenges. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that, um, again, it's about us being very focused on what those objectives are after mm -hmm. after thoughtful research and then very clear on who brings what to the table because mm -hmm. they are so challenging, um, these situations. But if we can um, have that clear directive and goal, mm -hmm. it allows mm -hmm. us to help keep our eye on that as we're trying to navigate and, and iterate. So the research also allows us to continue to learn what's effective, what's not, and where we need to change. So you brought you bring up sort of your the focus on social and emotional learning SEL right for children, and I guess my my question to that is you've got your partnership with IRC which is critical to especially distribution. How do you get it in front of the people that need it the most? But how do you track and evaluate your progress where it's working, where it's not working? Given that they're sort of intangible skills and. Are there any organizations that you partner with to try to better track and evaluate that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, listen, again, first of all, Sesame Workshop, and our 50-year history of producing yeah. Sesame Street around the world, we've always focused on a whole child curriculum. And that means it's not just literacy and numeracy and the academic basics, but the social and emotional skills that we know children need to thrive. So, again, first and foremost, it was, it was absolutely... Hey, Sherry, can you hear me? <laughs> I unfortunately can't hear you now, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. I, I think there, there might just be a slight audio issue. Um, I don't think others can hear you either in the last part of what you oh, were no. just saying. Right. There we go. You're back. back I hear you now. Okay, sorry. Now okay. you're back. All right. <laughs> what did I say last? Do you, do you remember? I'm sure <laughs> the best, I said the smartest things when the, when the, the audio was so sorry. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's what a lot of people say. I'll, I'll <laughs> anyway. it up, I'll it up. When you say, do we rely on others? Absolutely. So as I as I pretty much went through in the last question, how much we rely yeah, on course. local advisors and input in terms of and academic. That, and, but then the research is so important. So our, our partner on the ground in Ahlan Simpson, again, as an example, mm -hmm. is NYU, the Global yeah. Times. And they are, you know, excellent at both formative and research uh, and summative research. So mm -hmm. they are measuring our results as we go. And when mm -hmm. you ask what can you measure, you know, I'll give you an example. The first season of Alhan Simpson is out. As mm -hmm. I said, it, the, the goal and curricular focus is the emotional ABCs. And yeah. the research shows so far that results from watching a Hunt Simpson that parents reported that they are talking much more in homes about mm -hmm. emotional vocabulary and mm -hmm. defining that those um, emotions much more extensively. For instance, in mm -hmm. our research, you know, they, they only had a few ways to define emotion. It was just mad, sad, annoyed, you know, no yeah. large vocabulary for identifying that large range of feelings. And so not only are they now identifying those motions, but also talking about the techniques, belly breathing, yeah. um, counting to 10, asking for help. And so the research shows that we are having an impact in mm -hmm. creating strategies and models for children and families to cope with mm -hmm. these issues. And so that's critically important. No, critically important, and I think more. I, 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 it was. It's really interesting to me to know how you how you judge success in this space, how you how you track it. Uh, given it's not necessarily like you can just put in a test to all of a sudden see if it's if it's working. Has the public sector, in your experience, in all the different countries you're working in, you've talked about the NGO partnerships that you've been able to build, and of course, 
uh, the remarkable corporate partnerships that you've been able to build. How's, how's it been working with the public sector? I mean, has, has government been a impediment to uh, a lot of what you see as possible or, or no? No, no. In fact, you know, for us to really define success, we need to scale and you can't mm -hmm. scale alone without um, government. I'm a firm believer that mm -hmm. if we create proven models and we can share the research and the results, the, the goal is for the uh, governments and others to adapt and, and implement these proven models to improve their own systems and to reach more and more children. So, mm -hmm. so we work so closely with the ministries in each of these countries. But but the one thing I'll say since COVID that mm -hmm. I find most encouraging is that there seem to be so many more coalitions coming mm -hmm. together. I mean, I can name so many, Moving Minds Alliance, um, you know, um, there's, there's a number of organizations that are coming together to help focus on the importance of investing in early childhood, particularly in crisis settings. Um, so, you know, we we need, well, I'll give you another example. In Bangladesh, we work with um, uh, BRAC, another local uh, NGO. Um, mm -hmm. That was basically made possible from the Lego Foundation. After MacArthur mm -hmm. Foundation supported our Middle East work, the Lego Foundation stepped up, allowed mm -hmm. us to create additional programming in the Rohingya, crisis mm -hmm. area with a program called play to learn um, and so the whole point is that we can create these proven models that can then be adapted and used wherever children are in crisis and to um, with covid we've seen more and more people being receptive to this, mm -hmm. this content because quite frankly we have a means of reaching children through media through digital through broadcast mm -hmm. even when children and families are in isolation so mm -hmm. there has been a lot of um, outreach from local governments and ministries asking for the content. Well, and I want to add, sort of in the in the chat feature, Sherry, we've um, we've we've talked about the posts or the op-ed that you have in Medium about supporting the youngest refugees during the COVID nineteen crisis and beyond for people to read. So I urge everyone who's watching to please, after this is done, click on that and read Sherry's uh, thoughts specifically to that. And, and I love this other comment that we just got, which is, this is why Sesame uh, Workshop works. It uses play as a tool to teach, um, which I think is so important. Biggest single change to your work in these countries uh, post the pandemic. What, is, what has been the biggest change you've seen? Well the, well, the biggest change for us has been the fact that, you know, as I mentioned, we create educational content, but we rely on direct service providers to use these um, tools and resources in in-person services, whether that's home visits or learning centers. So obviously those in-person gatherings have had to be postponed. Um, mm -hmm. But what, it, what has been rewarding is that I think there's never been a time that the power and value of media, of digital, of, of, you know, we use every means possible from WhatsApp to mobile phones to just plain old phone calls, training, yeah. you know, the direct service or, uh, providers with, with the content, the tips, the, the coaching for parents, how to use play during this time, how to provide learning opportunities when you're at home in isolation. Mm -hmm. So I would say the biggest change is our means of reaching children and families in isolation but it has also been an opportunity because it's yeah. forcing us to be more innovative. We're doing broadcast specials around play to learn um, around the world. Uh, thanks again to the Lego foundation. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a lot of us are talking about when we come out of this to build yeah. back better and yeah. what moving minds Alliance or UNESCO and, or all these organizations that are coming together to, to really, promote the importance of investing in education for children in mm -hmm. crisis. And, and we mm -hmm. have a bias that early education is the most important. But yeah. I do believe that what we want to do is learn from these opportunities, how we'll continue to use them even when we do have the opportunity to be back in person and test okay. these because if they enhance the learning, then we're going to want to incorporate those other those other models. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's I think that's so important. And I think that's one of the things that Time is still passing us by, pandemic or no pandemic, st time is still passing us by. And if we don't get those things right for, for kids in their most vulnerable and at their youngest ages, then we're not going to get it right later. We've, yeah. as, as, one, as, as, a, as um, 
uh, a well-known board member of Concordia always says, you got to get the big picture right first before you before you go any deeper than that. And they can't get more pi big picture than the fundamentals here. Let's, listen, and if I can interject one thing, I would also say that you know, still less than 3% mm -hmm. of all humanitarian aid goes to education. And, um, and so often in a crisis, whether it's being displaced to begin with or a pandemic, it's young children and mm -hmm. caregivers who are left behind. And we, yeah. you know, thank God for MacArthur investing initially yeah. in Lego. So the hope is this will be a catalyst and an inspiration for others to do the same and invest in reaching the youngest in times of crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, Sherry, thank you very, very much. Well, I'm really uh, sorry for, for the technical difficulties. No. But Hey, listen, it's, 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 we're, we're just, we're just going with whatever works from minute to minute. So that's all we can do. Thank right, well, you very, very much. It's an honor to be included and thank you. Yeah. And it's great to see you, Matthew. And thank listen, you I know well. you have Vicki next and I am a yes. huge, huge fan of hers and the work she's done. Um, we're, we're finally expanding our humanitarian work into Columbia as well, but I can't good. wait. I can't wait to hear from her. Good, good, good. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Well, uh, I, we're now joined by Vicki, Vicki Colbert. Um, Hopefully she'll join in a minute. <laughs> I probably have to turn my camera off to let her on, correct? Okay, I think so. Right. Yep. Okay. okay, there we go. I'm gonna feel better if I'm not the only one who had challenges. <laughs> no, don't worry. Uh, I just know that Vicki's supposed to be on. Let's hope that she joins in a minute. If everybody watching can just bear with us for one second while we figure this out. Okay, so hopefully Vicki will be able to join in a minute, or at least that's what I'm told. Let's see. Vicki? I very much appreciate everybody who's watching uh, for your patience uh, as we go through this. I, I very, very much appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, I think we're just having some technical difficulties, so apologies about that. We're actually going to go back to Mel and Thor, if that works. If both of you can turn on your videos. There we go. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? When they... This is what we call truly winging it. So I appreciate everybody's patience as we uh, as we as we get through these next pieces. Um, I I took to heart what what Sherry was just talking about, which I think is so important about those those fundamentals for early childhood education, those basic and most important sort of pieces. And 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 I, I take that kind of a step further, which is we've got to get the big picture right. Um, and so one of the things I just want to continue to dive dive down into is how do we get that big picture right? So a question I wanted to ask you both uh, from the very beginning is to what extent do you think we did not get the big picture right as we went into this pandemic? And I know, I don't, I doubt anybody, uh, um, the three of us knew that a pandemic was going to hit in January and do what it's been doing to the world. Where did you see us uh, in the education space, uh, frankly, not, not be ready? Mel, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Perfect. You know what? What is what's frightening is how far we are from being able to do, you know, even basic things in countries that could afford it. I spent kind of six weeks during lockdown in Germany, which has been praised for, you know, like how well it treated the whole thing. But mm -hmm. I have two, um, you know, nieces and a nephew that go to Stuttgart, quite wealthy city in the south of Germany. And a, and a great public state school, zero online learning, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, nothing, you know? 
so they would get you know have to bring things copies and get once a week a phone call from the teacher and this is from an affluent city in an affluent country and things so i think germany woke up to this oh my god you know like um we we said you know close our school you know schools are closed tomorrow morning we start distance learning and then tomorrow mm -hmm. morning to find out there is no distance learning you know and um and so that's that's kind of the sad story because because it's i think all over the world uh, and 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 the other things which, you know, so I have kind of, you know, two hearts in my chest, you know. So the one is, I think, COVID nineteen is is a push for a lot of innovations that we've mm -hmm. missed in education. So one mm -hmm. is obviously mm -hmm. technology, not just an add on, could be at the core if well used. Um, the other one, a new role for the teacher. So my children had a, you know, uh, here in the UK, were luckier in, in the school they went to. They had quite intensive online learning, and you could see the teachers mm -hmm. sending them videos and things for content, and the teacher playing more the role of a coach and moderator. So you could see my, yeah. and and they've learned. My daughter's if desk, you know, computer, Microsoft Teams, diary. She learned so much in in, in a week, and her teacher said she learned so much in the week. So this is like the reform and the other side mm -hmm. while i know that parents in my kids school are calling the headmaster to get more advanced learning because children are fast in other ways you know teachers are calling to find out if children eat and so and this is in in like you know 10 miles from here and so the inequality and and that it showed um you know that you know society is divided and 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 that we may lose more by having more inequality is also something coming up. So there are like these two areas, a push for innovation um, that is very welcome. And, but on the other side, mm -hmm. kind of laying bare even more of the challenges. Yeah. Got it. That's, and, and, and can, sorry, go, go ahead, Thor. Yeah, and I can weigh in as well from, from the Danish perspective, because in Denmark, we, we have a, every, every K-12 uh, student in Denmark have a computer and have access to internet uh, during their school day and at home as well. So we are, we are very fortunate in our infrastructure and have been very fortunate uh, going into this uh, COVID uh, era. But although we have the infrastructure in place uh, and have been working uh, with uh, digital learning tools for the last 20 years on a very professional level uh, throughout the educational sector, there are still uh, a, a big part uh, of the educational sector that uh, that had an, a, 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 almost a breakdown because uh, because of the pedagogical uh, part of uh, of of suddenly having to to change uh, um, the the way you, you you're used to uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was uh, an, an eye-opener for us in Denmark. So one of the questions from those uh, watching is, how can we provide more space in the classroom for technology without incurring costs on schools and students? I'd love to open that up to, uh, to anybody on the, on the line right now, Sherry, Amal, or Thor. Who would like to take that? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I can. Yeah, uh, we, we're we're in constant uh, dialogue with both. Uh, well, in Denmark, the the public sector is very very large, and and mm -hmm. uh, a large part of, uh, of all all of our education is is public, uh, and and most of the. Fifty percent of uh, of uh, Danes are, are employed in in, in the public, uh, but uh, so 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 we 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 are of course uh, working at this uh, all the time, and, and we're in, in a great dialogue around uh, making sure that, that also that the teachers have their own um, um, have have a freedom to choose uh, what kind of uh, technology fits their uh, personal uh, uh, didactics uh, and pedagogical way of uh, of, of teaching. Uh, so that's uh, that's the that's the debate that we are uh, uh, con conducting uh, regularly. And I think maybe having so, a bigger whole system view. I mean, maybe some telecom companies will hate me now, but I think the thing is not just technology; it's connectivity and affordability. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think mm -hmm. in previous sessions people spoke about this, and and when you give a license in a country, let's say in the Middle East or Africa or somewhere else, Latin America, to companies. And it's kind of a cash printing license, you know, like mobile mm -hmm. telecom license. Um, why not negotiate that, you know, primary school gets a much lower connectivity contracts or for free or whatever. And, you know, like, so I think states could have governments could have played a bigger role in, in you know, equity if they yeah. have negotiated those licenses a bit in a different way. 
So as we wrap up today's conversation, and I want to thank uh, Sherry and Mel and Thor for joining us. Um, let's let's start with you, Sherry. I think biggest challenge you see over the coming months as we continue to grapple with COVID nineteen. Well, I think I think the biggest challenge is to have um, extended disruptions of in person services mm -hmm. and you know when mm -hmm. we first started planning and, and we've had to pivot as every organization had we pivoted first to start creating uh, enormous body of content on covid to help children specifically mm -hmm. with covid about health about prevention but also about managing anxiety from this mm -hmm. traumatic event and giving mm -hmm. um, parents in particular tools and resources to um, encourage learning at home through play through interactivity mm -hmm. it's so important um, so that was our first pivot. Then we had to, you know, also as a production company, we don't have studios in Jordan. Mm -hmm. We're doing everything yeah. from home, um, yeah. which also makes it more challenging, but we've figured it out. And we were as innovative and continue to be on how do we reach them if we can't be in person. So, mm -hmm. so as I said, that is a positive because it's forcing us to be more innovative and creative. But I, we always thought it would be for a little while. And now we're really having to look at our, our longer term planning. I mean, what if mm -hmm. there's is not uh, we're not back into a new normal for an extended period of time? And how can mm -hmm. we really keep up the, the reach in order mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. sure these children are not falling behind? So I see that as the as the biggest challenge and and not having enough investment in in reaching children with education in crisis. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that. That is an ongoing challenge. Amel? I think that for me, the biggest challenge could be that education budgets, you know, are thrown out of the window, honestly, because I mean, we see these trillions. It's the biggest crisis in peacetime we have had, you know, since World War II. I don't think it's going to be month. I mean, put me under the pessimist. I think it's going to be a two to four year stint here. And, um, and the thing is, um, you know, I see education ministers sit in cabinets with finance ministers and they're telling them, yeah, we're spending all this for economic recovery and education is seen more like as, okay, something for the future, knowing that actually these kids are going to be paying all those debts that we are accumulating. Mm -hmm. so the question, whole life. how can we create a narrative? And, and, and you know, um, some people out there have been really working hard. How can we create a narrative that one education is a solution also to pandemics and, and to what's happening. And that for every dollars, euro, whatever you spend in economic recovery, you should spend the same in education and culture. It's Perfect. because it's like if you fight terrorism only with police mm -hmm. and putting these mm -hmm. young people in suburbs aside and not and close all the theaters and schools and cultural activity, you're shooting yourself on the foot. And it's the same with economic yeah. recovery. If you pay only economic yeah. recovery, but education is going to be cut uh, budgets then um, you said and I I don't see that narrative I'm disappointed in the G20 and the G7 meetings education is not on the agenda and I think wow. so there is a lot of work for all of us um, to, to, mm -hmm. to kind of find that narrative why education is key to the solution now and not in the future let's I mean let me let me put it a different way right which is education we need to get back to policy making recognizing that education is a must-have not a nice to have and it seems yeah. like a lot of times it's treated from a budget perspective as a nice to have. Uh, it Thor, we'll give you the be a capital investment. It should be considered a capital investment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thor, we'll give you the last word because I know we're Ooh. running over a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, of course, I concur in this uh, this uh, this issue. It's 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 very important to 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 look at the at, at education as as an investment uh, in in the future. And 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 right now, it's uh, it's being under prioritized uh, all over the mm -hmm. world uh, because of, uh, of of the crisis yeah and uh, and 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 the, as as uh, sherry has pointed out uh, a couple of times the the um, the the social uh, problem stigmas around uh, around the kids just going uh, around at home uh, is is very very uh, mm -hmm. um, problematic um, for for in exceptionally uh, children in in need or with a with a weak uh, home uh, it's it's uh, it's a big problem uh, and we have to do something about that it's not a, a viable solution uh, in in four months half a year two to four years it's it's not at all not at all 
So we yeah. need to get uh, a, a better idea of how to how to do uh, uh, real education and do the social part of education as well. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Sherry, Amel, Thor, thank you very, very much. We were sorry to miss Vicky, and uh, but but Elias is back, so Elias is here to to wrap it up for us. Thank you. No, it, it, I want to thank once again. Uh, this this was a great panel. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Amel. Thank you, Thor. Um, uh, Matthew, you did a terrific job. I always knew you are a master in uh, stage. But now you're also dealing extremely well with remote online <laughs> uh, things we can't control. So once again, yeah. thank you very much, everyone. We keep this conversation. And, and as uh, ML and Sherry said, uh, times, futures is a little bit challenging, but we can't let it uh, more than uh, the time you yeah. said, ML. This is too long, three, four years. We have to act. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Matthew. Thank you. Well, this is the end. Uh, my friends, uh, our time together is unfortunately coming to an end. However, we hope that the last three days have inspired you with uh, new ideas uh, and broadened the network with uh, the contributors you met uh, remotely. This has always been the power of WISE, to convene specialists from across the world and facilitate collaborations that could help shape our education systems for the future. Uh, over the last few months, we've, been, we've, we've seen a complete overturn of our education systems worldwide, with school closures leaving teachers, students, and parents to grapple with an entirely different teaching and learning paradigm. We could not have predicted the onset of this recent crisis. However, the question that we explored last November in our big summit in Doha and Qatar seemed to have gained increasing importance since then. What does it mean to be human? And what should we unlearn and relearn in order to adapt to this evolving landscape? These core themes of resilience, adaptability, and humanity have certainly resonated throughout each of the discussions we've seen during our WISE online forum. We hope that this online global gathering has provided a comprehensive overview of some of the most pressing issues in education today, as well as shed light on the exciting ways we've begun to innovate and meet these new challenges head on. I want to thank you. I want to thank each and every one of you who who, who've been engaged with us the last three days. Over 4,000 people between uh, following here in Webinar Jam or following the YouTube uh, live from around the world have participated in these sessions. We would not have been able to build such a rich program with, without the contribution of the inspiring speakers, uh, our partners, Global Salzburg Seminar in Holland IQ, and the media partner, the Pi News and GMD Edu. And I have to say a big word, a big thank you to the WISE team. We've also had the honor of hearing from eminent figures and leading experts from around the world. In day one, we had Stefania Giannini, the Assistant Director of Education, uh, who reminded us at UNESCO, who reminded us that close to 500 million children or learners targeted by national learning platform do not have access to the internet at all. UN Special Envoy for Global Education, Gordon Brown, urged us to unite to protect our disrupted education systems and reimagine the future of our children. Moreover, he called on the international community to rally behind a global campaign called Save Our Future to ensure all children can return to school and education systems are built back better. We heard from Mike Ferrick. CEO and founder of Allison, urged us to rethink what we consider to be a modern education. If we are to see real change, education must no longer be considered as a mainstay of academic institutions, but rather an agile agency beyond the classroom. And we heard from Mayor Daniel Quintero from Medellin in Colombia 
who shared his vision by, for, for building resilient system that are not just prepared for changes in the near future, but for 2050 and beyond. To do so, we need to leverage existing technology and social policies so that we can offer more support to the communities most vulnerable to the effect of the recent pandemic. We missed amazing speakers such as Vicky uh, and, and Amira and, and sorry for the technical. So I want to thank them. I want to take this opportunity to thank them once again. Uh, and, and I hope we will have another opportunity to hear from their work and to hear the, 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 the great work they're doing in their uh, country and their communities. Lesson learned. What have we learned? While the future is impossible to predict, one of, the, one of the key takeaways from this online forum has been the need to reimagine how we future-proof our learning ecosystem so that we can not only endure the waves of change coming our way, but leverage these moments of uncertainty to imagine, to reimagine education for the future. So what can we do? Technology has been misunderstood as the panicia of education persistent problems around access and quality education. However, the recent pandemic has underlined the need to consider technology in a more nuanced way, not as a magic solution, but rather as a medium to help teachers create meaningful learning experiences for their students. With this in mind, it is imperative that we help practitioners create spaces for learning in and outside of the classroom through technology. This means leveraging existing tools to ensure access, building cross-sector partnerships to redefine 21st century learning and asserting the need for access to technology and infrastructure to be considered as a basic human right. If we want to see the next era defined by progress and global collaboration, we have to get there together. I am optimistic about our capacity to change. All the great ideas that have been shared these last few days have demonstrated our willingness to gather, engage, and learn from one another. The need to be part of something bigger than ourselves, to contribute to the communities we are a part of, is something that lies at the heart of what it means to be human. Whilst we are parting away for now, the team and I at WISE will be working on new ways to share the expertise from our global community. So please stay tuned. Stay in touch, and we will hopefully see you again soon. Thank you very much.